Hello. Here's the supercut of my The Last Guardian series thing, based on the book by Jeff Grubb. Basically, it's just all the episodes in one big long video, without all the separate intros and outros and stuff. Hope you enjoy. Also, consider buying the book, because Jeff Grubb probably has bills to pay or something. And that's it. That's the intro. See ya. But, 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 but. A young man stood in the courtyard of Karazan, desperately trying to remember his own name. He was absolutely petrified of what he had to do next, which was to present a crimson sealed letter of introduction to the most powerful mage of Azeroth. The scholars of the Kirin Tor had told this boy that this was an honour, an opportunity, they'd said. But that was a load of bollocks. In truth, the Kirin Tor had been trying to place an inside man within Karazan for years. But up until recently, its inhabitant, Mediv, had just completely ignored them. So when the mysterious wizard's sudden request for an assistant arrived at Dalaran, the Kirin Tor were more than happy to comply. So, this particular youth was selected and shuttled off with a list of directions, orders, counter-orders, requests, suggestions, and demands, etc. Things like ask Mediv about his mother, and find out all you can about elven history. One person even asked him to sift through Mediv's collection of bestiaries, because they were completely and utterly convinced that there was a fifth type of troll that no one knew about. But Norlan, the chief artificer, had advised the youth to be direct, forthright, and honest. All traits that the great mages Mediv apparently seemed to value. Be diligent. Do what you're told. Don't slouch. Always seem interested. And above all, keep your ears and eyes open. Now, some people would probably view all this curiosity as slightly suspicious, but it was actually kind of normal. The Conclave were an insatiably curious bunch. Hell, it's probably my own curiosity that got me selected in the first place, the young man thought to himself. He'd gained a bit of a reputation after wandering the halls of the Violet Citadel at night and uncovering a few secrets that his masters would have preferred to have been kept quiet, like the Chief Artificer's fondness for flame wine, or Corrigan the Librarian's secret demon porn collection. And there was something about some guy called Orexus. He'd disappeared, or died, and for some reason the others chose to make no mention of it, even removed any evidence of Orexus's name, which was a bit weird. But basically, this young man had a knack for sniffing out juicy deets, and it was entirely possible that his mentors viewed him as a little too good at ferreting out information, and were quite happy to see the back of him. The young man then took a deep breath, steeled himself, and strode toward the tower itself, but as he drew nearer, there was a flicker of movement on a balcony above which caught his eye. And for a brief moment, he thought he saw a robed figure, staring down at him before disappearing like some kind of ghost or something. It was a bit ominous, but a voice then came out of nowhere and scared the shit out of the boy. You are the new young man, the stooped thin figure then emerged out of the shadows and for a second, the prospective assistant wondered if Medivh had been mutating forest animals to work as his servants. Guy looked like a bold weasel. He said, you are the new young man. Sorry, Khadgar. Dalaran. Khadgar of Dalaran. In the kingdom of Lordaeron. I was sent by the Kirin Tor from the Violet Citadel of Dalaran. Khadgar then handed his sealed letter of introduction to the bold weasel servant. Right. Khadgar of Dalaran of Lordaeron of the Kirin Tor of the Violet Citadel of Dalaran. Great. He sent me to assist Medivh. Lord Medivh. The Wizard Medivh. Of Karazan. Khadgar was fully aware he was babbling, so he tightly clamped his mouth shut so he could babble no more. I'm sure they did. The servant then reached into his own waistcoat and pulled out a set of black rectangles bound by a thin metal band. Blinders? No. Um... No, thank you. Morose. What? I am Morose, steward of the tower. Castellan to Medivh. Blinders? Uh, no. Thank you, Morose. The servant turned and motioned to the Khadgar follow, and Khadgar picked up his rucksack and wondered what the hell that was all about. Are you alone in the tower? Eh? Are you alone? Do you live here by yourself? The Magus is here. Yes, of course. Wouldn't be much point for you to be here if he wasn't here. Of course, but anyone else? You, now. More work to take care of two than one. Not that I was consulted. Nobody tells me nothing. So just you and the wizard then, normally. And Cook. Though Cook doesn't talk much. Thank you for asking, though. Khadgar tried to restrain himself from rolling his eyes, but failed. Hopefully the blinders on either side of Moreau's face kept him from seeing that. So why the blinders? Eh? 
The blinders. Why? Eh. The magic's strong here. Strong and wrong sometimes. You see things. Unless you're careful. I'm careful. Other visitors, the ones before you, they were less careful. They're gone now. Gadgar thought back to the ominous robed phantom he'd seen on the balcony and nodded. Cook has a set of rose quartz lenses. Swears by him. Cook's a dumbass. So, you've been in the Magus' household for long? Eh? Have you been with Medivh long? I yep. Long enough. Too long. Seems like years. Times like that here. What do you know about him? The Magus, I mean. The question is, what do you know? Surprisingly little, Gadgar thought. Considering every elder mage in Dalaran seemed to hold the guy in awe, there was precious little information available. He was a young man, apparently, as far as wizards went, merely in his forties, and for the vast bulk of that time, it seemed to have made no impact whatsoever on his surroundings, which was a feat in itself, to be fair. Independent wizards had a tendency to be extremely showy, and fearless in dabbling in secrets that man was not meant to know, and as a result, non-Dalaran mages always met the same grisly fate an explosion of their own making. The fact that Medivh had not completely obliterated himself on a molecular level could only mean that he either had great restraint or great power. But still, nothing in Khadgar's extensive research had ever indicated any great discovery or groundbreaking achievement to explain why Medivh was held in such high regard. Only small hints, like his mother. She was supposedly important, apparently. Eh? I don't know much. Of course you don't. And people never know much. Is what makes him young, I suppose. I meant I don't know much about Medivh. You... you asked. Did I? Huh. What is he like? Like everyone else. Has his moods. Good days and bad. Like everyone else. Puts his pants on one leg at a time. Nah. He levitates into them. The old servant looked at Khadgar with the slightest tug of a smile on his face. Eh? After climbing what felt like all of the stairs in the world, they arrived at a final, much narrower staircase that Khadgar surmised was likely the topmost tip of the tower. And upon ascending those, the two entered a small circular room that looked to serve as some kind of observatory. And inside said observatory was a man of middling years lost in thought, Medivh. Khadgar then took a step forward, but Morose raised a hand, causing Khadgar to freeze in place, almost as if transfixed with a magical spell. The servant then walked quietly over to his master, stood next to him, and waited, and waited, and waited. It felt like an eternity of waiting. Until finally, Medivh recognised his servant's presence, quickly jotted down some things in his notebook, and then turned to face his new guest. And as Khadgar looked into his potential new mentor's eyes for the first time, he saw something dance and flicker within. Something powerful, perhaps uncontrollable. Something dangerous. Morose then handed the sealed letter of introduction to his master, and Medivh glanced down at it for a few moments. Didn't open it though, just kind of stared at the envelope, furrowed his brow ever so slightly, and the parchment then burst into flames. So, it seems our young spy has arrived at last. Khadgar knew full well his eyes were wide, and his face was pale, but there wasn't much he could do about it. Are you ill? Rose, is he ill? Winded, perhaps. It was a long climb up. Finally, Khadgar managed to gather his senses, at least enough to say, Why'd you burn the letter? You didn't even read it. Sir. The Master Mage then chuckled. Oh, great and respected Magus Medivh, Master Mage of Karazhan, I bring you the greetings of the Kirin Tor, most learned and pure sant of the magical academies, guilds, and societies. Advisors to kings, teachers of the learned, revealers of secrets. They continue along those lines, blowing smoke up their asses for quite a while. How am I doing so far? Couldn't say. I was instructed not to open the letter. But you did anyway. Khadgar slowly nodded, steeling himself for the response. <laughs> when? On the voyage from Lordaeron to Colteris. There was no wind, so we were stuck for two days, and curiosity got the better of you. Medivh then smiled. I probably would have opened it the moment I was out of sight of the Violet Citadel, personally. I considered that, but I figured they probably had some divination spells in operation. At least at that range. And you wanted to be far from any spells or message recalling you for opening the letter. And you patched it back together well enough to fool a cursory examination. Tell me, how did I do that? Do what, sir? Know what was in the letter. 
The letter I just burned says that I will find the young man Khadgar impressive in his seduction and intelligence. So, impress me. You read my mind? Possible, but incorrect. You're a stew of nerves right now. That gets in the way of mind reading. One wrong. You've gotten this sort of letter before? From the Kirin Tor? You know how they write? Also possible? I have received such letters before, and they do indeed tend to be overweening in their self-congratulatory tone. But you know the exact wording as well as I do. A good try, albeit the most obvious, but also incorrect. Too wrong. Kagar's mind was now racing, whilst his heart thundered in his chest. Sympathy. Explain. One of the magical laws. When someone handles an item, they leave a part of their own magical aura attached to it. Auras vary with individuals. It's possible to connect to one by affecting the other. In this way, a lock of hair may be used in a love charm, or a coin tracked back to its original owner. Medu's face remained unreadable. Continue. The more someone uses an item, the stronger the resonance. So therefore, an item that receives a lot of handling or attention will have a stronger sympathy. A document that someone has written has more aura to it than a blank piece of parchment, and the person is concentrating on what they are writing, so... You were mind-reading. Just not my mind. You were reading the mind of the scribe who wrote the letter at the time he was writing it. Hmm. You're not bad. Not bad at all. You know your counter spells? To the fifth roster. Can you power a mystic bolt? One or two, but it's draining. Your primary elementals? Strongest in flame, but I know them all. Nature magic? Ripening, culling, harvesting? Can you take a seed and pull the youth from it until it becomes a flower? No, sir. I was trained in a city. Can you make a homunculus? I understand the principle, but doctrine frowns on it. You sailed here from Lordaeron. What type of boat was it? Um, a Jurassian windrunner. Human crew? Yeah. Did you speak with them at all? A little. I think they found my accent funny. Yes, they are easily amused. Any non-humans in the crew? No, sir. The Jurassians did tell stories of fishmen. Murlocs, I think they called them. Are they real? They are. What other races have you encountered? Other than variations of humans. Some gnomes were at Dalaran once. And I've met dwarven artificers at the Violet Citadel. What about trolls? Or goblins? Uh, there are four known varieties of trolls. There may be a fifth. That would be the bullshit Alonda teaches. Trolls are savage. Larger than humans. Um, tribal. Almost completely removed from civilized lands. Almost extinct in Lordaeron. Goblins? Uh, smaller? Sort of dwarf size? Just as inventive, but in a destructive fashion? Fearless? I've read that there's a race they're insane. Only the smart ones. You know about demons? Of course, sir. From the legends. All mages of Dalaran are taught the proper abjurations and protections from day one. But you've never summoned one. Or been present for a summon. No, sir. I wouldn't even think of it. I do not doubt that you wouldn't. Do you know what a guardian is? A guardian? Like a parent? <laughs> Don't worry. You're not supposed to know. It's part of the trick. So, what do you know about me? Khadgar shot a glance towards Morose, only to realise the bold weasel had buggered off at some point. Didn't even notice him leave. The young man then stammered for a moment. The mages of the Kirin Tor hold you in high regards. Obviously. You're a powerful independent mage, supposedly an advisor to King Lane. We go back. Beyond that, yes, nothing specific to justify the high esteem. It's supposed to be that way. But all of that aside, what do you know about me? Nothing, sir. Nothing? You came all this way for nothing? Did you even bother to check? Perhaps I was just an excuse for your masters to get you out of their hair, hoping you'd die en route. Wouldn't be the first time someone's tried that. There wasn't much to check. You haven't done that much. I mean, not much that I could find out, sir. <laughs> but what did you find out? Ah, uh, you come from a spellcaster heritage. Your father was a mage, one Nihilus Aaron. Your mother was Aegwyn, which may be a title as opposed to a name. One that goes back at least 800 years. You know King Lane and Lord Lothar from your childhood. But beyond that, nothing. Oh, and your name means Keeper of Secrets, in High Elven. I found that out as well. All too true. Aegwyn is not a title, 
By the way, it is merely my mother's name. Then there were several Aguins. Probably a family name. Only one. <laughs> but that would make her over 750 years old when I was born. She is much older than that. I was a late child in her life. Which may be one reason the Kirin Tor is so interested in what I keep in my library. Which is why they sent you. Sir, to be honest, every mage save the highest in the Kirin Tor wants me to find out something from you. And I will accommodate them as best I am able. But if there is material that you wish to keep restricted or hidden, I will fully understand. If I thought that, you wouldn't have even made it through the forest to reach here. I need someone to sort and organize the library. And after that, the alchemical laboratories. I think you'll do nicely. You see, I know the meaning of your name just as you know mine. Morose? Cadgar jumped as the bold weasel suddenly manifested out of nowhere. Take the lad down to his quarters and make sure he eats something. It's been a long day for him. One question, Master. I mean, Lord Magus, sir. Call me Medivh, for now. What is the meaning of my name? You don't speak Dwarven? No. My name means Keeper of Secrets in High Elven. Your name means Trust in the Old Dwarven language. So I will hold you to your name, young Khadgar. Young Trust. Morose escorted Khadgar to his quarters, explaining a few things on the way down. Things like most of the meals in the tower were simple fare, porridge and sausage for breakfast, a cold lunch, and a large hearty dinner, which was usually stew or a roast or something. Cook would retire after evening meals, but there were always leftovers in the kitchen. Medivh kept hours that could be charitably described as erratic. And finally, you're an assistant rather than a servant, but you'll still be expected to be available to help the Master Mage whenever he deems necessary. I'd expect that, as an apprentice. Not an apprentice yet, lad. Not by Arf. But Medivh said, you could sort out the library. That's assistant's work, not apprentices. Others have been assistants. None became apprentices. Cadgar's brow furrowed. He'd not expected there to be a level before apprentice in the Mage's hierarchy. How long before? I don't know. None have ever made it that far. Well, how many other assistants have there been? Morose then looked off to the distance, and Cadgar couldn't tell whether he was deep in thought or if his mind had just wandered off. Dozens. At least. An elfling. No, two elflings. You're the first from the Kirin Tor. Dozens. Oh. How long did they last? Days. Sometimes hours. One elf didn't even make it up the stairs. Because he didn't have blinders. Anyway, Bog's at the end of the hall. Tidy yourself up, then come down to the kitchen. Cook will have something warm for you. Kagar entered his room and saw that it was a pretty modest dwelling. A bed, a desk, a closet. He quickly threw his rucksack in said closet and walked over to the window. The room was still situated high up the tower, so the view was quite extensive. From this height, Kadgar could see that this land had once been a crater, worn and weathered by the passage of time, and Kadgar wondered whether Medivh's mother had been here when the land rose, or sank, or been struck by a piece of the sky. 800 years. Bloody hell. Even by wizard standards, that was a long time. Most human wizards were looking pretty frail by 200 years old, but to be 750 and bear a child? <laughs> Medivh must have been having him on. Preposterous. Kagar then left his room and visited the facilities at the end of the hall. Once again, pretty spartan. A basin, a mirror, and a toilet. What more do you need? So Kagar washed his face a bit, took a dump, and now it was time to make his way to the kitchen. But there was a slight problem. He had no idea where the kitchen actually was. He'd seen some stables on the ground floor, and they'd passed a banquet hall on the way up. Kitchen is likely going to be somewhere near the banquet hall, he thought. So he found a staircase and started making his way down. Soon enough, he found the banquet hall. But now he found himself faced with multiple exits. The first one he chose ended up in a dead-end hallway. The second choice, exactly the same. But the third led to something completely different and unexpected. The ceiling above him opened up suddenly to reveal a sky the colour of blood, and a whole bunch of men in armour, armed for battle, appeared around him. The men were shouting and pointing, but their voices seemed indistinct and muddied, as if underwater. Is this a dream? Khadgar thought, and he passed out from exhaustion without realising it. No, he could feel the heat of the sun and the breeze in the air. This felt too real to be a dream. Khadgar then examined his surroundings. These soldiers were atop a small hill, with makeshift battlements crafted from whatever they could find. This was no castle or fort. They'd chosen this spot to fight only because there was no other available to them. 
This was somewhat of a last stand. The soldiers then parted, revealing their apparent leader. His gear seemed more like a scholar's robes than a soldier's armour, and he then started bellowing orders with a voice that sounded like the raging sea itself. The warriors seemed to understand what he was saying, though, because they all sprang into action, forming up neatly along the barricades. The commander then brushed past Khadgar, and the young man stumbled backwards. And despite the fact that the rest of the soldiers had not seemed to notice Khadgar's presence, this commander bloke did. The commander's eyes looked deeply into Khadgar's eyes, and Khadgar gasped at what he saw. The commander then simply nodded at him, and then he was off, bellowing more orders to the soldiers. The warriors themselves then started to yell and shout and point off at the distance, and as Khadgar turned to look at what they were pointing at, they saw a wave of green and black advancing towards them. An army of monsters. And Khadgar decided now was probably a good time to cheese it. So he turned and ran, and almost slammed right into Morose. You were late. You get lost. <sighs> oh, I was... <sighs> I saw... Ah, misplaced. Khadgar looked at Morose and nodded mutely. Late supper is ready. Don't get misplaced again. The bold weasel then turned and walked off, leaving Khadgar alone. And he was very much alone now. Any evidence of the vision he'd just witnessed was nowhere to be seen. No soldiers, no green monsters, only a memory that scared Khadgar to his core. But it wasn't the bloodshed or the monsters that terrified Khadgar. It was the mage warrior commander. His face was aged, his hair greyed, but his eyes, they were unmistakable. They were Khadgar's eyes. He recognised them from many a time looking in mirrors and stuff. And it was at this moment that Khadgar thought, I really need to get myself a pair of blinders. We'll start you off slow, take stock of the library, figure out how you're going to organise it. But first, it was breakfast time. Porridge and sausages, just as Morose had said. The conversation over the breakfast table was mostly about Dalaran. What was popular there? What were the fashions in Lordaeron these days? What kind of arguments did the Kirin Tor have? There is one current philosophical debate. When one creates a flame by magic, I can't seem to decide whether it's called into being or summoned from some parallel existence. Fools. They wouldn't know an alternate dimension if it came up and bit them on the... What do you think? I think it may be something else entirely. Excellent. When given a choice between two, always choose the third. Now, let's see how you do with the library. Morose will show you the way. Upon arrival at the library, Khadgar immediately saw that it was an absolute bloody disaster. Books and scrolls scattered all over the place and a thin layer of dust covering pretty much everything. <laughs> Start me off slow, he said. I could have your gear packed in an hour. No, it's just more of a challenge than I anticipated, is all. Heard that before. Khadgar turned towards the bold weasel to ask what he meant by that, but Morose was gone. Bloody ninja, that guy. And so, Khadgar got started on the task at hand. He picked his way through the debris, examining each book and scroll and thing as he collected it. At one point, Khadgar picked up a book with an ornate metallic cover surrounded by scorch marks on the ground, and as he opened it, the book started to tick. So he very carefully closed it and placed it on a table. And it was at this point he realised this place wasn't just a tip, it was a death trap. So Khadgar reached into his pocket and pulled out a deus ex machina, a small metallic cricket gifted to him by one of his instructors back at Dalaran. Within it was a simple but effective spell that warned when a trap was nearby, so that's convenient. After winding the little metal cricket up, he waved it over the book that had been ticking, and unsurprisingly the cricket started screaming. So Khadgar set that trapped book to one side. He then picked up another volume, and the cricket was silent, so he set that book on a different side, and so on and so forth. I know you, Khadgar, sir, the new assistant. Of course, forgive me, the memory is not what it once was. Too much going on, I'm afraid. Anything you need aid with, sir? Just the library, young trust. How are things going in the library? Good. Very good. I'm busy sorting the books and papers. Ah, by subject? Author? I'm thinking by subject, eventually. Many are anonymous. <laughs> Never trust anything that a man will not set his reputation and name upon. Now, about the Kirin Tor. To say the next week was like Groundhog Day would be a bit of an understatement. Each day began with porridge and sausages, a brief conversation with Medivh to discuss progress, which would then suddenly become a conversation about Dalaran. And then, a whole lot of cleaning and organising in the library. But, one week into Khadgar's stay, something was different. Medivh was nowhere to be seen. Gone. Gone where? I don't know. 
Well, what's he doing? I don't know. Well, when will he be back? I don't know. So he's just going to leave me alone in this tower? I'm unsupervised with all of his stuff? I could stand guard over you if that's what you want. Gadgar shook his head. Rose. I am young, sir. These visions. Blinders? Do they show the future or the past? Both, I think. And the ones of the future, do they come true? In my experience, young sir, yeah. Cook once saw a vision of me breaking a piece of crystal, so she hid him away for months. Finally, the master asked for that piece of crystal, and within two minutes, but he broke it, didn't I? Anyway, that's enough jibber-jabber. Work needs doing. On his way up to the library, Khadgar was ever so slightly troubled. He'd finished sorting the books into safe and unsafe piles, but now Medivh was gone, leaving him high and dry without further direction. The logical next step would be to restock the shelves with the books, but most of them were untitled, or so worn and scuffed that the titles were illegible, meaning the only way to determine the contents of a book would be to open it, which was fine for the safe pile, not so much for the pile that made the little cricket MacGuffin scream like it was on fire though. But the young assistant went ahead and got started, because there was no telling how long Medivh would be gone, and he couldn't just sit on his ass doing nothing. However, a short while into opening books, Khadgar came across one that he couldn't open, because it was locked. At no point during his cleaning and organising over the past week had he come across any kind of key lying around, so he went ahead and grabbed a knife, thread it into the lock, and heard a satisfying click of traps and locks. The nature of securing devices. Hmm. Another two weeks passed, and in that time, Khadgar had basically claimed the library as his own. And thanks to that book about locks and traps, the young assistant had made quite a bit more progress in his task, because trapped books are a lot less intimidating once you understand how traps work. Knowledge is power and all that. There were still a few trapped books that Khadgar hadn't quite figured out yet though, but he resolved to find out what was within them, either on his own or by threading the knowledge out of Medivh at some point, if that was even possible. Thief! Interloper! Khadgar quickly turned to see Medivh standing in the doorway, who then began to intone a string of alien syllables and weave some kind of spell. Despite himself, the young assistant raised a hand and wove a symbol of protection, but he might as well have just been giving Medivh the middle finger or something because the Magus's spell slammed hard into Khadgar and bowled him over. Who are you? What are you doing here? Khadgar. Assistant. Cleaning library. Medivh blinked at Khadgar's words and then straightened as if he'd just woken up. Sorry, lad. I'd forgotten you were still here. I assumed you were a thief. A thief that insisted on leaving the room neater than he found it. Medivh then looked around the room as if for the first time since entering it. Aye, I don't believe anyone else has ever gotten this far before. I've sorted by type. Histories, including epic poems to your right. Natural sciences on your left. Legendary material in the center. The more powerful material, alchemy, spell theory, go on the balcony. But some books I couldn't identify. You're going to have to look at those yourself. Yes. Excellent. Excellent job. Very good. Now, come with me. Medivh started to walk off, but then noted he was not being followed. Are you coming? Coming where? To the top? Come now, or we'll be too late. Time is of the essence. Medivh then hesitated for a moment. I apologize for before. My memory is not what it once was, young trust. I should have remembered you were in the tower. I assumed you were a... Sir, you said time is of the essence. Time. Time. Yes, it is. Don't lollygag. It was in this moment that Khadgar realised the haunted tower and disorganised library may not have been the only reason people swiftly left Medivh's employ. But he went ahead and followed the mages. Morose, the golden whistle, if you please. Already took the liberty, sir. They're here. They? Who's they? A sudden rustle of feathers sounded from above, and as Khadgar looked up, he saw some griffins descend from the sky. Hitch yours up and we'll go. I've never... I don't know how to... <sighs> Did the Kirintor teach anything of use? Medivh then muttered a few words and touched Khadgar's forehead, causing the young man to stumble back. Now you do know how. Let's go! Khadgar thought about it and gasped. Somehow, he bloody did know how to properly harness a griffin now, and how to ride one. That was new. Follow me! The pair then launched into the air. How long they flew, Khadgar could not say. He was too busy being amazed by the fact he was doing this thing that he didn't know how to do about ten seconds ago. But eventually, they reached a large marsh, or swamp. And beneath them, 
Khadgar could see flames from some kind of encampment. And as they drew closer, it became apparent that the flames were in fact wagons set alight, with corpses tossed like children's dolls on the sandy ground. It looked like a caravan that had been looted and set ablaze, and yet, the goods themselves were also scattered on the ground. Bandits would have taken the booty and the wagons, Khadgar thought. So who did this? Suddenly, as if to answer that question, a whole bunch of arrows arched up from the surrounding brush. Medivh pulled back on his reins, avoiding the attack, but Khadgar wasn't so lucky. An arrow pierced Khadgar's griffin's wing, and the next thing Khadgar knew, he was no longer safely on his griffin's back. He was now plummeting unsafely to his death. The air rushed out of Khadgar's lungs as he struck the ground, but he didn't die, because he landed on a pile of leaves or a haystack or something. However, he wasn't out of the woods yet, so to speak. Khadgar then heard movement and voices, so he quickly hid as best he could, despite feeling like he'd just been hit by a truck. The voices were barking in an unfamiliar tongue, a language that sounded guttural and the opposite of friendly. But there was no mistaking that they were definitely searching for him. They'd seen him fall, and they were now shambling through the wreckage. Something tickled at the back of Khadgar's brain, but he couldn't quite place it. He was too busy slowly backing out of the clearing, hoping the darkness would keep him hidden from these creatures. But that plan failed, because he backed right into one of the creatures he was trying to escape from. And as he turned, he realised the thing that had been tickling his brain was recognition. He'd seen these monsters before, in that vision he'd had. The beast pointed its spear at the youth and let out a bellowing challenge. However, its challenge was cut short, because Khadgar instinctively muttered a word of power, raised a hand, and unleashed a small bolt through the creature's midsection, straight up murdering it. Khadgar then stood in stunned silence at the thing he just did, but only for a moment, because the monster's roar had alerted the others. It was impossible to know just how many exactly were now converging on Khadgar's location, but it was definitely a lot, and the youth knew he didn't have the power to beat all of them. Just that one bolt had already made him quite sleepy. But choosing it wasn't really an option either. These monsters probably knew this dark swamp that surrounded them better than he did. There was no sign of Medivh up in the sky. On the one hand, he could have landed somewhere and was now sneaking up on the monsters. But on the other, he may have just completely forgotten Khadgar existed again and gone home. So Khadgar really only had one option. It wasn't the greatest option, but perhaps these monsters were a bit dumb. Perhaps he could trick them into believing he was powerful and scare them away. So he grabbed the slain monster's grizzly spear and strode purposely towards the beasts. The monsters watched cautiously as he approached, probably wondering what the balls he was doing, and Khadgar then tossed the spear into the fire and summoned a bit of flame in his own hand. Leave or die. One of the brutes took a few steps towards Khadgar, so he muttered another word of power and blasted the green non-human right in the face. Flee, or face the same fate. Khadgar could barely make eye contact with the monsters and he felt like he was about to shit himself. This would be a good time for his bluff to work, because he'd fired off two mystic bolts now, and he probably didn't have a third in him. However, a high cackling laugh then filled the air. The green warriors parted, and another figure shambled forward. This one thinner and more hunched than the others. Human wants to play. Wants to play at the spells. Northgren can play. Leave. Now. Northgren merely laughed again at Khadgar. The youth's voice had started to waver, and his bluff wasn't really fooling anyone. However, as the robed orc took a step toward Khadgar, two brutes to his right suddenly burst into flames, and in the place where the creatures had been, now stood Medivh. My apprentice told you to leave. You should have followed his orders. Rothgren knows you, human. You're the one- <coughs> Are you alright, lad? Fine. However, Khadgar was not fine. He was exhausted, and he immediately collapsed to his knees. Rest. Recover your strength. The worst is over. Khadgar nodded, but then looked at the burned monster bodies around them. Those things. What were they? Orcs. Those were orcs. Now, no more questions for the moment. The sound of hooves then filled the air. The cavalry. Too loud and too late, but don't tell them that. They can pick up the stragglers. Now rest. Khadgar must have indeed drifted off for a bit, because the next thing he knew, he was surrounded by soldiers. The background had changed, and Medivh was talking to some stocky older man, who had the weathered face of a person who'd seen some shit. Khadgar, this is Lord Anduin Lothar. Lothar, this is my apprentice, Khadgar of the Kirin Tor. Khadgar's mind then started to race. Bloody hell, it was the king's champion. Boyhood companion of both King Lane and Medivh. Bit of a celebrity. And also, bloody hell. Did Medivh just say Khadgar was his apprentice? So you finally got an apprentice. 
I have to go to the Violet Citadel to find one, eh, mate? Find one of suitable merit? Yes. What's this one done to impress you? Oh, the usual. Organised my library. Came to Griffin on the first try. Took on these orcs, single-handed, including a warlock. He organised your library. I am impressed. Lord Lothar, your skill is known even in Dalaran. Rest, lad. Don't worry. We'll take you from here. You won't. Not if you stay on the road. The King's Champion blinked in surprise. The lad's right, I'm afraid. The Orcs already seem to know their way around this swamp. They seem to know the Black Morass better than we do. If we stay on the roads, they can run circles around us. Maybe we can borrow some of those griffins of yours to scare. The dwarves that train them may not take kindly to that. We'd be better off talking to the gnomes. They have a few whirly gigs and sky engines that would be more suitable for scouting. Lothar nodded and rubbed his chin. How did you know they were here? I encountered one of their advanced scouts near my domain. After a bit of squeezing, he told me there was a large party looking to raid here. I had hoped to arrive in time to warn them. A young soldier, little more than Khadgar's age, then hastily approached. A survivor, me lord. Pretty badly chewed up, but alive. Mages, could you come take a look? Of course. Lothar, stay with the boy. He's still a little woozy from everything. And then, the Master Mage buggered off. Gaggar tried to rise and follow him, but the King's Champion placed a heavy gauntlet on the youth's shoulder and held him down. However, Lothar then regarded Khadgar with a smile. So, the old coot finally took on an assistant. Apprentice. He's had many assistants. They didn't last. Well, so I've heard. I recommended a few of those assistants. They came back with tales of a haunted tower and a crazy demanding mage. What do you think of him? It was Khadgar's turn to blink for a moment. In the past 12 hours, Medivh had attacked him, shoved knowledge in his head, dragged him halfway across the country, and then left him to face off against a handful of orcs. But then he did rescue him, and there was that really cool time where he called him his apprentice and stuff. He is... more than I expected. Ha! <laughs> yeah! He's more than anyone expected. That's one of his good points. Lothar then rubbed his chin in thought again. That was a very... Polite, diplomatic response. Mordoran is a very polite, diplomatic land. So I've noticed. Dalaran ambassadors seem to be able to say yes and no all at the same time. And say nothing as well. No offence. None taken, my lord. How old are you, lad? Seventeen. Why? Huh. Makes sense. What makes sense? Med. Lord Majus Medivh was a young man, several years younger than yourself when he fell ill. As a result, he never really dealt much with someone of your age. Ill? The Magus was ill? Yeah. Seriously. He fell into a coma. Lane and I took him to Northshire Abbey. The only brothers there fed him broth to keep him from wasting away. He was like that for years. And then, poof, he woke up. Right as rain. Or almost. Almost. He fell asleep a teenager and woke up a grown man. So I worry about him. Kagar then thought about Medivh's temperament, his mood swings. Perhaps if he was a younger man, his behaviour would make a little bit more sense. His coma. It wasn't natural. He calls it a nap, as if it were perfectly reasonable. But we never found out why it happened. I mean, he might have figured it out, but he's shown no interest in the matter. Even when I've asked. I am Medivh's apprentice, why are you telling me this? Lothar then sighed deeply. I worry about him. He's alone in that tower. He has a Castellan. And there's Cook. With all of his magic. Ah. Hence trying to get apprentices in there. To spy on your friend, Khadgar thought. You worry about him, but you also worry about that power of his. Well, what can I do to help? Keep an eye on him. If you're an apprentice, he should spend more time with you. I don't want him to fall into another coma. Because you need him, Khadgar thought to himself. Because there's orcs suddenly everywhere. I would be honoured to help you both, Lord Lothar. Now that my loyalty must be to the Master Mage first, but if there is anything a friend would need to know, I will pass it along. Lothar then gave Khadgar another heavy pat with his gauntlet. There's something else. As the Lord Mage has spoken to the Guardian, do you? I've heard the name spoken from Medivh's lips, but I know nothing of the details. Ah, and let's just pretend I didn't say nothing. I'm sure we'll talk of it in due course, though. After all... I've not been his apprentice for very long. Lothar then raised an eyebrow. Well, how long have you been his apprentice? Counting until dawn tomorrow. 
Um, one day. Medivh then chose that moment to return. He and Lothar exchanged glances, with the Major simply shaking his head and Lothar frowning deeply. Guess the survivor didn't make it after all. Are you up for travel? Well enough. Don't know if I can handle a griffin, though. It's just as well. Your mount got spooked and cheesed it. We'll have to double up. But you've then blew some kind of whistle. So, I'm your apprentice. Yes. I passed your tests. Yes. I'm honoured, sir. I'm glad you are. Because now starts the hard part. I've seen them before. It had been a whole week since the Battle of the Swamp, if you can call it that. After returning to the tower, Gadgar took a day off for recovery, but his apprenticeship then truly began. For the first hour of the day, before he was even allowed to have porridge and sausages, Gadgar practiced his spells under Medivh's tutelage. And then after breakfast, and for most of the day, Gadgar would assist the Master Mage with a whole bunch of tasks. He'd take notes, run errands, hold things for Medivh, as if he was some kind of table or something. And it was in that particular moment of being a table that Khadgar finally felt comfortable enough with the older mage to tell him what he knew about the ambush. Seen who before? The orcs. You didn't mention them when you first arrived. I remember specifically asking you about other races. You said gnomes and dwarfs, not orcs. It was in a vision. After I arrived here, a battlefield. Those creatures were attacking us. Hmm. And it wasn't here. Wherever I was, the sky was red as blood. <clears throat> Red skies, you say? Yeah, like blood. Medivh's mood then suddenly shifted. Khadgar thought he'd grown used to the Mentor's mood swings, but this one seemed particularly weird. Tell me everything. So Khadgar did. He mentioned everything he could remember, with Medivh interrupting constantly. What was the world like? What was in the sky? Were there any banners amongst the orcs? Medivh even asked what the orcs were wearing, which seemed a bit thirsty. But Khadgar answered each and every single one of those questions. And as he did, the older mage seemed to calm down. However, there was one thing Khadgar didn't mention. The warrior mage commander. For some reason, Khadgar didn't feel right about mentioning that. And Medivh seemed much more interested in the orcs and the environment than the humans that were there anyway. Curious. That is a new one. Sir, where do these visions come from? Go fetch some wine from the kitchen. This may take some explaining. Soon enough, Khadgar returned with some wine, and the two of them sat down. You do drink, don't you? A bit. We have wine with dinner at the Violet Citadel. Yes. You wouldn't need to if they just got rid of the lead in the water supply. Now, you were asking about visions. Yeah. I saw what I described to you and Moroz. Well, he said people see things like that all the time here. Moroz is right. That this tower is a place of power should not surprise you. Mages gravitate towards such places. Such places are often where the universe wears thin allowing it to double back on itself. Perhaps even allow entry to the Twisting Nether, another world's entirely. Is that what I saw then? Another world. But Eve held a hand up, as if to say, shush your face, I'm expositing, and took a sip of wine. So Khadgar went ahead and took a sip too. Once, long ago, something powerful exploded here, carving out the valley and weakening the reality around it. And that's why you sorted out. That's one theory. You just said there was an explosion long ago that created this place. You then came, yes, that's all true, if you look at it in a linear fashion. But what happens if the explosion occurred because I would eventually come here and the place needed to be ready for me? Well, that's complete nonsense. Things don't happen like that. In a normal world, no, they do not. But magic is the art of circumventing the normal. That's why the philosophical debates in the halls of the Kirin Tor are so much buffle and blow. They seek to place rationality upon the world, and regulate its motions. The stars march in order across the sky. The seasons fall one after the other with lockstep regularity. Men and women live and die. But when that doesn't happen, it's magic. Both of them paused and sipped more wine. How does time work, young trust? Time. We use it. We trust it. Measure by it. But what is it? It's a regular progression of instance. Like sands through an hourglass. Excellent analogy. What I was going to use myself. But compare the hourglass with the mechanical clock. You see the difference between the two? Kagar shook his head, and more sips of wine were drank. You're not daft, boy. It's a hard concept to wrap your brain around. The clock is a mechanical simulation of time. Each beat controlled by a turning of the gears. 
You can look at a clock and know that everything advances by one tick of the wheel, one slip of the gears. You know what's coming next because the clockmaker built it that way. Okay? So, time is a clock, but it's also an hourglass. The hourglass also measures time, true? Yet, you never know which particular particle of sand will fall. But the end result is always the same. All the sand has moved from the top to the bottom. What order it happens in does not matter. So? So, you're saying that it may not matter if you set up your tower here because of the explosion, or that the explosion occurred because you would eventually set up your tower here. Close enough. So these visions are what? Bits of sand. But he frowned slightly, and even more sips of wine were had. Like, if the tower is an hourglass and not a clock, then there's just bits of sand. Of time itself. That are moving through it. We can see them, but not clearly. Some of it's part of the past, some of it's part of the future, and some of it could be of other worlds as well. Hmm. Possible. Full marks. Well thought out. The big thing to remember, Khadgar, is that these visions are just that. Visions. They waft in and out. With this tower or clock, they would move regularly and be easily explained. But since the tower is an hourglass, they don't. They move at their own speed and defy us to explain their chaotic nature, which I, for one, am quite comfortable with. I was never a big fan of an orderly, well-planned universe anyway. But if you ever sought out a particular vision, wouldn't there be a way to discover a certain future and then make sure it happened? But Eve's mood went ahead and darkened again. Or make sure it never comes to pass. No. There are some things that even a master mage respects and stays clear of. This is one of them. But no. But no. But no. Now, we've had a bit of wine. Let's see how it affects your magical control. Levitate my mug. But we've been drinking. Exactly. You will never know what sands the universe will throw in your face. You can either plan to be eternally vigilant and ready, eschewing life as we know it, or be willing to enjoy life and pay the price. So the lever take my bloody mug. It was in this moment that Khadgar realized just how much wine they'd actually drank. Twas a lot. He desperately tried to clear the fuzziness from his mind and concentrated hard on the ceramic mug. <laughs> the good thing about this recent promotion to apprentice was that Khadgar got the evenings to himself. Medivh had even given him free license in the library to research as he saw fit including the myriad questions that his former masters in the Violet Citadel had requested. However, there had been one caveat. My only demand is that you show me what you write before you send it to them. Not because I fear you'll keep something from me, young trust, but because I'd hate for them to know something I'd forgotten about. So Khadgar hit the books pretty hard, most evenings. He found a whole bunch of epic poems about Medivh's mother fighting some unnamed demon for Guzbar. For Lady Delth, he found a whole bunch of elven tomes, for Alanda, he plunged through every bestiary he could find, and unfortunately could not push the number of troll species past four. And finally, Khadgar spent his evenings trying to find out some more information on this whole Guardian thing he'd heard so much about. But so far, Khadgar's research had turned up a whole bunch of diddly squat. Only a brief passing mention in an elven tome about royal histories. The Guardian had attended this wedding, or that funeral, or been the vanguard of some attack. Was the Guardian a position, perhaps? Or was it a single being? And what the bloody hell was a Tyrus foul? That word had popped up a few times as well. Suddenly, Khadgar could smell vegetables. And as he thought, why can I smell vegetables? The temperature of the room rose, the walls darkened, and the next thing the young man knew, he was in the jungle, sitting at a campfire with three 12 or 13 year old looking motherfuckers, who were laughing and joking and having a whale of a time. It took a few moments for Khadgar to recognize the kids, but he realized they were none other than Medivh, Lothar, and the future King Lane. But their reverie was soon interrupted by some movement in the bushes, and then a troll jumped out. All three of the boys sprang to action, and a fight ensued, with another two jungle trolls jumping out the bushes and attacking as well. Lane even got injured during the fight, getting stabbed in the arm with a spear. But, thanks to Medivh's magic, and Lothar and Lane's fighting skills, the boys were ultimately victorious. And then there was stunned silence for a bit. Lane tried to make a joke to break the tension, but Lothar shushed him and pointed towards Medivh. The young mage was still standing over the burned troll, his fingers hooked like claws, 
and his jaws tightly clenched. Lothar and Lane rushed over to him, but Medivh then collapsed. Watch out for me. The weird thing was, Medivh didn't seem to be looking at Lothar or Lane when he said that. He seemed to be looking directly towards Khadgar. The Master Mage's eyes then rolled up into the back of his head, and Young Trust. The vision dropped away as quickly as a magician's curtain, and Khadgar found himself back in the tower, with present-day Medivh staring at him. Are you alright? I called out, but you didn't answer. Sorry, Med... Sir. It was a vision. I was lost in it, I'm afraid. Not more orcs and red skies. Trolls. Blue trolls. In a jungle. I think it was this world this time. Medivh's concerns deflated. Jungle trolls. I met some once. Down south in Stranglethorn Vale. But no orcs this time, right? No, sir. Good. Do you have Song of Aegwin? What? Song of my mother. It would be an old scroll. I swear, Khadgar, I can't find anything here since you cleaned. It's with the other epic poetry, sir. Khadgar really wasn't sure whether he should tell Medivh the details of that latest vision, because he wasn't entirely sure whether it was his place to talk about something so personal and invasive. But he did wonder whether that was the moment Medivh had fallen into his coma. I have to go. Tonight, I'm afraid. Where are we going? I go alone, this time. I'll leave instructions for your studies with Morose. Well, when will you return? When I'm back. Alright. Fine. I'll just sit here and figure out how to tame an hourglass, Khadgar thought. Medivh was gone a week, all told, but it was a week well spent for Khadgar. Khadgar did receive some responses from the mages at the Violet Citadel. Guzbar wanted more transcripts of poems, especially ones about Aegwin. Lady Delth claimed she hadn't received any of the things Khadgar sent, and asked if he could send them all again, which was probably a load of bollocks. And Lady Alonda was adamant that there had to be a fifth breed of troll, and the whole joke here is that Lady Alonda is the one that's actually correct. But sod all of them, Khadgar thought. They can wait. These visions are more important. The key to Khadgar's incantation, it seemed, would be a simple spell of far-seeing. A divination that granted sight of distant objects and far-off locations. It was priestly magic of the holy sort. And before anyone says, no it's not Buttress, it's a shaman spell. Well, human clerics used it as well, so go suck a whole bag of totems or something. But, with a bit of modification, so that it worked over time instead of space, Farsight was just the thing a mage would need to tame some visions. But refitting a spell for a new activity wasn't as simple as changing the words or altering the hand gestures. It required a deep and precise understanding of how the spell actually worked. And the best way to figure out how a spell worked was to fail in spectacular fashion and see what happens. Of course, there was the potential for this to result in Khadgar exploding himself, but what ifs? But after about five days, Khadgar had gained a full understanding of the Farsight thing and built the framework for his wizardy time version. Any bits of misplaced time within the tower would be highlighted, glow a little brighter, feel a little hotter, and an added bonus to the spell that Khadgar had not anticipated is that it would tune the vision a little better as well, removing the distortion and clarifying what individuals were actually saying. So no more of that mere nonsense, unfortunately. So, on the evening of the fifth day, Khadgar headed to Medivh's fully equipped pantry of spell components and grabbed a whole bunch of necessary ingredients. Amethyst, rose quartz runes, you know, the basics. And then, back at the library, he began casting his new spell. Bring me a vision. Bring me a vision of a young Medivh. There was a rush of air, and the library began to transform as it had before. But, as the temperature dropped quite drastically, and Khadgar found himself now stood knees deep in a bank of snow, he started to think he might have possibly summoned the wrong vision. Ahead of him, moving up the veil, was an army of demons with great bat-like wings. However, a woman then came up from behind Khadgar, radiating her own sense of brilliant power. Khadgar had absolutely no doubt that she could see him, but she paid him no mind, and simply observed the approaching demon army, completely unafraid of it. And her eyes, well, Khadgar recognised those eyes, He'd felt that same penetrating gaze before, from her son. This was Aegwyn, mother of Medivh. He was witnessing her epic battle against the demon hordes, which coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, just so happened to be chronicled in the poem that Medivh had most recently been looking for, the last time Khadgar saw him. Aegwyn then frowned slightly, with a storm of power flashing within her eyes, and it didn't take long at all for the anger to be released. With a simple raising of her arm and a little chant, she summoned a shard of elemental lightning that arced through the air and struck a whole bunch of demons down. It was one of the most effective mystic bolts Khadgar had ever seen. Even the demons that weren't hit recoiled in shock. However, that only lasted but a moment before the army bellowed and charged. And Aegwyn didn't flinch. 
In fact, she was smiling. That sort of knowing smug smile of someone that felt pretty bloody confident that they were going to win. And then an epic battle ensued, right up until she was face to face with a larger demon, presumably their commander. You are a fool, guardian of Tirisfal. Am I, Falspawn? I came here to spoil your dragon hunt. Seems that I've succeeded. You are an overconfident fool. Every incubus and petty demon, every nightmare and shadow hound, every dark lord and captain of the Burning Legion, all have come here while you have fought these few. I know. You know? You know that you are alone in the wilderness with every demon raised against you. You know. I know. I knew you'd bring as many of your allies as possible. A guardian is too great a target to resist. And yet you came anyway, alone, to this forsaken place. Oh, I never said I was alone. Aegwyn then snapped her fingers, and the sky suddenly darkened, as if a great flock of birds had been disturbed and were now blocking the sun. Except, it wasn't bloody birds. There were more dragons in the sky than you could shake a stick at. More dragons than Khadgar had ever even imagined existed. Foul spawn of the Burning Legion. It is you that are the fool. Explody gory sound. I wasn't supposed to say <laughs> I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Another epic battle ensued, but at the centre of the demon army, something sinister was happening. Powerful spellcasters were chanting away, desperately trying to achieve something, and Aegwyn just kind of stood there, grinning, whilst chanting her own dark and inhuman spell. Khadgar didn't recognise it, and had no idea what she was doing, other than possibly fighting the spell the demons were constructing. But that seemingly failed because a huge flash then erupted from the centre of the demonic horde, a full-on rip in the universe appeared, and Khadgar watched in horror as a god emerged. It was a titanic figure, larger than any giant of myth, greater than any dragon. Sargeras. Guardian, the time of Tyrus Fall is about to end. This world will soon bow before the onslaught of the Legion. Not as long as there is a Guardian. Not as long as I live. Surrender now. I have use of your power. Never. Then die, Guardian. And let your world die with you. Aegwyn then raised both hands and unleashed a shout. Half curse and half prayer. And a flaming rainbow of colours erupted from her palms and struck at Sargeras' chest. It seemed to Khadgar like shooting a pea at a brick wall, and yet, Sargeras actually staggered back under the blow, and the wound in his chest then seemed to slowly expand, consuming his flesh. Sargeras regarded the growing devastation with surprise, then alarm, then slight frustration about the whole thing, and then fear, touching the wound only to see it spread to his limb as well. Sargeras then started chanting a spell of his own, his words growing louder and more passionate, and then he started to glow. But. Aegwyn then unleashed yet another bolt of lightning, and then it was over. The titanic Sargeras fell forward and face-planted the ground, and Aegwyn started laughing and walked down the hill towards her vanquished foe. And then, Khadgar was back in the library. He immediately pulled out a pen and some paper and started jotting down everything he'd seen. He was almost in a trance and wasn't really thinking much about what he was writing. <clears throat> Khadgar turned to see Morose staring at him, slightly annoyed by the interruption. The mage is back. Once you up at the observatory level. Medivh's back. That's what I said, innit? You're to fly to Stormwind with him. Stormwind? Me? Why? Because you're his apprentice, that's why. Okay. Uh, let me just gather my things up. Finish this. Take your time. It's only the Magus that wants you to fly to Stormwind Castle. Nothing important. Top level. Chop chop. Rose then buggered off and Khadgar stood there for a moment. But the news of Medivh's return, and the fact that they were about to go to Stormwind, had disrupted Khadgar's train of thought about the vision. So, he quickly looked at the last thing he'd written in his notes, and saw the words, Aegwyn had two shadows. What the hell did that mean? He didn't outright remember writing that, or even necessarily noticing it, consciously. Oh well, probably nothing to worry about. So Khadgar gathered his tools and things, and off he went. Before this moment, the greatest buildings that Khadgar had ever seen were those of the Violet Citadel itself. It was a point of pride for Khadgar. Nothing, not even Medivh's tower, had come close to the grandeur of the Kirin Tor's architecture. But now he'd seen Stormwind. It was a sight to behold, greater in size than anything in Lordaeron, and bustling with life. And the castle, well, the castle was glorious, a city within a city, and Khadgar wondered how it was even possible to build such a grand place without some sort of magical aid. Was there some sort of magical aid? Maybe that was why Medivh was so valued in this place. Who knows? Anywho, Lord Lothar was already waiting for them as they landed their griffins. 
Apprentice. Good to see you're still employed, my lord. Med. I came as soon as I could. You have to get along without me sometimes, you know. Well, His Majesty, we'll have to wait. Take me to the chamber in question. Actually, you said it was Hooglin and Hagarin, correct? I know the way myself. Let's go. No time for pleasantries, apparently. Medivh was off. He's in a fine mood. He's been agitated all night. He'd been gone for the past week. Only just got back when your summons arrived. Has he told you what this is about? No. Two of the greatest sorcerers of Stormwind are dead. Bodies burned almost beyond recognition. And their hearts have been ripped out. There's evidence of demonic activity. Which is why I sent for the mages. Perhaps he can tell us what happened. Where are the bodies? As Khadgar entered the room, he saw it was an absolute shambles. Every book pulled from the shelves. All the furniture was broken. And at the centre of the room was an inscription carved into the floor itself. And two scorch marks. Both man-sized. Where are the bodies? Where are the remains of Huglar and Hagarin? They were removed. It would have been unseemly to leave them here. We didn't know when you'd arrive. You didn't know if I'd arrive, you mean. Fine. We can still salvage something. Who else has been in here? Let's see. Um, the Conjurer Lords Huglar and Hagarin. Well, yes. They had to have been in here to have died here. Who else? One of their servants found him. And I was called. And I brought several guardsmen to move the bodies. They've not been buried yet, if you want to examine them. Who? The bodies or the guardsmen? <laughs> no, we'll take care of that later. So that's a servant, yourself, about four guardsmen, would you say? And now me and my apprentice. No one else? No one I can think of. The Magus then closed his eyes and muttered a few words under his breath, but his eyes then flew open again. Young Trust, Lord Magus, I need your youth and inexperience. My jaded eyes may just be seeing what I'm expecting to see. I need fresh eyes. Come here. Don't cross the circle itself. There may still be some lingering enchantments. Stand here. Now, don't be afraid to ask questions. But what do you sense? A wrecked room. Now don't tell me what you see. Tell me what you sense. Khadgar took a deep breath. He cast a quick minor spell that sharpened one's senses. And as soon as he did, things felt different. Usually, Magic had a feel of lightness and energy, but this, this was thick and sticky and jizz-like. Khadgar had never felt anything like this before. In fact, it started to get so thick, sticky and jizzy that Khadgar started to feel smothered and fell to his knees. But Medivh then helped him to his feet. I didn't expect you to succeed even that well. Good try. Excellent work. What was that? The magic has been particularly twisted here, a remnant of what occurred earlier. The two dead mages here were summoning demons. It's that taint that you feel here. That heaviness of magic. A demon was here. That's what killed these poor powerful idiots. Summoning demons. In the King's Tower. No matter how wise and wonderful, there's always one more sliver of power. One more bit of knowledge to be learned by any mage. These two fell into that trap. And paid the price for it. Morons. But how? Surely there were protections. Wards. That's a mystic circle of power on the floor. Easily breached. Easily broken. Medivh then knelt down and closely examined the ring of power and picked up a thin piece of straw. See? A simple broom straw. If this was here when they began their summoning, all the adjurations and phylacteries in the world would not protect them. The demon would consider the circle to be no more than an arch. A gateway into this world. I've seen it before. Khadgar took another look around the room. It really was a disaster in there. Nothing was in the place where it was supposed to be. It seemed kind of unlikely that the broom straw would have been the only thing that had remained in the same place. How were the bodies found? What? Oh, uh, sorry. You, you said I could ask questions. When I came in, they were on the ground. The servant hadn't moved them. Face up or face down, sir? Heads towards the circle or towards the window? Uh, circle. Face down. What are you driving at, young trust? If you hit someone from the front, they fall back. If you hit someone from the back, they fall forward. Was the window open when you arrived? Lothar looked towards the open window and thought about it. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, I think it was. But it might have been opened by the servant. The stench was terrible. I can ask him. No need. The window was likely open before your servant entered. So your theory, young trust, is that Uglar and Ugarin were standing here, watching the magic circle, when something came in the window and hit them from the back. They fell forward and were burned in that position. 
Yes, sir. Hmm. It's a good theory, but wrong, I'm afraid. Lothar, with the bodies burned front and back. Yes. There you go. Huglar and Agarum were facing the demon within the circle. Demon breathed fire, burned the front. Two mages fell forward. Flame spread to the back. Gadgar felt that warm feeling of embarrassment on his face cheeks. Sorry, it was just a theory. It was a good one. Just wrong. The window is open because that's how the demon left the tower, which means it's in the city right now. What? Yep, it's probably laying low at the moment. Killing these two fools would have been quite taxing for it. I need to organize search parties. No, I'll do this myself. I'll need to see the remains though. That'll tell me what we're dealing with here. All right, follow me. In a moment. Lothar, would you grant me and my apprentice a moment alone? Uh, sure. I'll be just outside. There was a bit of awkward silence after Lothar exited the room until Medivh broke it. In civilized countries, apprentices don't disagree with their masters. At least in public. I'm sorry. He said don't be afraid to ask questions. The positions of the bodies didn't seem enough. He did the right thing. If you hadn't have spoken up, I may not have realized the demon skittered out the window. But you asked questions because you don't know much about demons. And that is ignorance. I will not tolerate ignorance. So, tell me, what did you learn of demons in your time at the Violet Citadel? Sir, Lothar's waiting. Maybe we should... Lothar can wait. He's good at waiting. Answer my question. I've heard the legends. In the first days, there were demons in the lands and great heroes rose to drive them out. That's the basics. What we tell the Hoi Polloi. Surely you know more than that. The official teachings in the Violet Citadel is that demonology is to be avoided. Any attempt to summon demons will be stopped at once with culprits expelled. Or worse. Come on, Khadgar, you're a curious lad. Tell me what you know. <sighs> the general belief is that when the demons were defeated, they were driven out of this world entirely. Into their own domain. The great dark beyond. They're still out there. Or so the legend goes and they want to come back. Some say they speak to the weak willed in their sleep, urge them to find old spells and make sacrifices. Others say they want worshippers to make this world like it once was, bloody and violent, and only then can they return. Well, that's a start. A lot of people couch it in the form of legends and fairy tales, but I think you know as well as I do that demons are real. They're a threat to all of us, on this world and others. The beyond is a prison for these demons, a place without light or succor. And they are very, very anxious to get back here. Khadgar nodded, and Medivh continued. Your your assumption that their victims are weak wielders in error? There are obviously some occasions of simple folk invoking demonic forces for revenge or riches. But there are those who walk willingly towards the abyss, powerful enough to harness demonic energies. What about these two? Uglar and Agarin, I mean. The most powerful, wisest and finest mages in Stormwind. So surely they would have known better? You would think so. Yet here we stand in the wreckage of their chambers. So why do it? Many reasons. Hubris, that false pride that goes before the fool. Fear of the unknown, of the known. Fear of things more powerful than them. Or well, what could be more powerful than two of the most powerful mages in Stormwind? Me. They killed themselves summoning a demon playing with forces best left alone because they feared me. You. Me. I think it's time I told you the story of the Guardian young trust, and of the Order of Tirisfal. Looks like Lothar's going to be waiting a little bit longer. To understand the Order, we must understand demons. We must also understand magic. Lord Medivh, if there's a demon loose in Stormwind, we should probably concentrate on that. Not history lessons that could wait till later. Medivh looked Khadgar up and down, and for a second, the young mage feared he was about to receive yet another angry outburst from his master. But the elder mage merely shook his head and smiled. Your concerns would be valid if the demon in question was a threat to those around it. But it isn't. Trust me. Even if it were one of the more powerful officers within the Burning Legion, it's expended almost all of its personal power in dealing with the two mages that summoned it. What's important right now is that you understand what the Order is, what I am, and why others are so deeply interested in it. But the sooner I finish, the sooner I will know that I can trust you with the information, and the sooner I will go out and deal with this petty demon. So if you truly want me to go, then let me finish. Khadgar opened his mouth to protest yet again, but then thought better of it. Guess it was time for another lesson. So what is magic? An ambient field of energy that pervades the world. Stronger in some locations than others, but ever-present. 
Yes, at least now. But imagine a time when it was not. Magic is universal. Like air or water. Okay, like water. Imagine a time at the very start of things when all the water in the world was in one location. All the rivers and seas and streams, all in one place, in one well. Kagar nodded his head. Now, instead of water, it's magic we're talking about. A well of magic. The source. An opening into other dimensions. A shimmering doorway into the lands beyond the great dark. The first peoples to cast spells encamped around the well and distilled its raw power into magic. They were called the Calderai then. God knows what they call themselves now. Medivh quickly glanced at Khadgar to make sure his eyes weren't glazing over. The Calderai grew powerful from their use of magic, but they did not understand its nature. They did not understand that there were other powerful forces in the great dark beyond, moving in the space between worlds. They hungered after magic, and were very interested in any who tamed it. These malign forces were abominations and nightmares from hundreds of worlds, but we simply call them demons. They sought to invade any world where magic was mastered and grown, and destroy it, keeping the energies for themselves alone. And the greatest of them, the master of the Burning Legion, was a demon named Sargeras. Khadgar thought back to his vision of Aegwyn and suppressed a shudder. The Lord of the Burning Legion was powerful, but subtle. He worked to corrupt the Calderai, and he succeeded, for a dark shadow fell upon their hearts. They enslaved other races in order to build their empire. Now there were some, with greater vision than their brethren, willing to speak out against this rising darkness and pay the price for it, but they were ignored, labelled fearmongers, propagandists, woke SJW beta cucks. The Calderai were too far gone. They opened the way for Sargeras and his lot to invade this world, and only by the heroic actions of a few was the shimmering doorway through the great dark shut, exiling Sargeras and his followers. But that victory came at a cost. The Well of Eternity exploded, and that explosion destroyed the very continent it rested upon. Those that shut the door were never seen again by living eyes. Kalimdor. Medivh looked at Khadgar, a little bit shocked. It's an old legend, in Lordaeron. Once there was an evil race who meddled foolishly with great power. As punishment for their sins, their lands were broken and set beneath the waves. It was called the Sundering, and their lands were called Kalimdor. Huh. Well, that's the child's version of the tale, but yes. When the Well of Eternity exploded, the magical energies within scattered to the four corners of the Earth. And that is why magic is universal. It's the power of the Well's death. But Magus, that was thousands of years ago. Ten thousand, give or take. So how does a legend that old come down to us? Dalaran itself only has histories going back twenty centuries. And the earliest of those are probably bollocks. But Eve nodded but then just continued the story. Many were lost in the Sundering, but some survived, and some of those survivors went on to form the Order of Tirisfal. They took the knowledge of what had happened and swore to keep it from ever happening again. But with magic spread into the fabric of the entire world itself, it wasn't long before other races, humans, started scratching at the doors of reality. And in that moment, those Calderai that had survived and changed themselves came forward with the story of how their ancestors had almost destroyed the world. The first human mages considered what the surviving Calderai had said, but they realized that even if they were to lay down their wands, grimoires, and ciphers, others would still seek ways to allow demons access once more to our green lands. So they continued the order, now as a secret society amongst the most powerful of their mages. This order of Tirasfar would choose one of its number to serve as guardian, and this guardian would be given the greatest powers and be the literal gatekeeper of reality. Only now, the gate was not some single great well of power, but rather an infinite rain that continues to fall even today. It is nothing less than the heaviest responsibility in the world. And that was that. But he fell silent, his eyes losing focus briefly. You're the guardian. I, I am the child of the greatest guardian of all time. I was given her power soon after my birth. It was too much for me, and I paid for it with a good chunk of my youth. But you said the mages chose among themselves, right? Couldn't she have picked an older candidate? Why your own child? The first guardians, for the first millennium, were chosen among the select group. However, over time, politics and personal interests came into play, such that the guardian soon became little more than a servant, a magical dog's body, 
Some of the more powerful mages felt it was the Guardian's job to keep everyone else from enjoying the power that they themselves commanded. Like the Calderai before us, a shadow of corrupting power was moving through the members of the Order. More demons were getting through. Even Sargeras had manifested the smallest bits of himself. A mere fraction of his power, but enough to slay armies and destroy nations. Once again, Khadgar thought back to his vision. So that was just a fraction of Sargeras. Jesus. Magna Aegwin, my mother, was born nearly a thousand years ago. She was greatly gifted and chosen by the Order to become the Guardian. But the truth was, they thought they could control her. Use her as a pawn for their own political games. But she surprised them. She refused to be manipulated. Some thought that her independence was a passing thing. That when her time came, she would have to pass the mantle on to a more malleable candidate. But again, she surprised them. She used the magics within her to live for a thousand years. So, the Order and the Guardian split. The former can advise the latter, but the latter must be free to challenge the former. For a thousand years she fought, even challenging the physical aspect of Sargeras himself. He'd instilled an avatar into this plane and sought to destroy the mythical dragons. But my mother defeated him and locked his body away in a place no one knows. That's in that epic poem, The Song of Aegwin, the one Guzbar wants. But she could not be guardian forever, and there must always be a guardian. Only my mother had one more trick up her sleeve. She bore a child, naming it as her successor. And she threatened the order. Either her choice was honored, or she would not step down, taking the power of the Guardian into death. They felt they might be able to manipulate the child better, so they allowed it. The power was too much. When I was a young man, younger than you, it awoke within me. I slept for over twenty years. Egwin had so much of a life. I seem to have lost most of mine. Khadgar stood there for a moment, kind of unsure what to say, but Medivh then continued his massive bloody monologue. While I slept, evil crept back into the world. There are more demons now. More of these orcs as well. And now members of my own order are once more taking the dark path. Uglar and Agarim were members of the order, yes. You may have noticed the disappearance of an instructor, Erexus Bagadalaran. He was part of the order as well. Something very similar happened to him. They covered that one up pretty neatly, though. They feared my mother's power, and now they fear me. And I have to keep their fear from destroying them. Such is the charge laid upon the Guardian of Tirisfal. So I must be off. Off. As you have so rightly noted, there's a demon afoot. I must find it before it regains its wits and strength. Okay. Well, where do we start? We do not start anywhere. You're talented, young Trust, but you're not up to demons quite yet. This battle is my own, Apprentice. Magus, I'm sure I can- Shh. I need you here, with your ears open. I have no doubt old Lothar has spent the past ten minutes with his ear to the door. So much so, he probably has a keyhole-shaped impression on the side of his face. He knows a lot, but not all. I need someone to guard the Guardian, as it were. Gadgar looked at Mediv, and the older mage simply winked. He then strode to the door, and yanked it open. Med, his majesty will understand perfectly that I would rather meet with a rampaging demon than the leader of a nation. Priorities and all that. In the meantime, will you look after my apprentice? But Eve didn't wait for Lothar to agree or confirm to do that. He just buggered off, leaving the old warrior staring at a 17-year-old. Let's, uh, see if we can find some lunch. Soon enough, they found some lunch. Beer and chicken. My lord, despite the mages' request, I realise you probably have other things to do. Nah. Most of it was taken care of whilst you two were talking. King Lane's in his quarters, under guard, in case that demon decides to come knocking. I've got agents spreading through the city, keeping watch for anything suspicious. Now there's nothing to do but wait. So that's exactly what they did. Waited. Eating their chicken and drinking their beer in silence. Until... So how is he? In good health. You've in that yourself, my lord. Ah, they can dance and bluff his way around just about anyone. But how is he really? He's demanding. Very demanding. And intelligent. And surprising. I feel like I'm an apprentice to a whirlwind sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And a thunderstorm too, I suspect. Yeah, he has his moods. Like anyone. Hmm. 
An ostler has a mood and he kicks the dog. But a mage has his moods and a tan disappears. No offence. None taken, my lord. He's a very powerful person. You think he's too powerful? No, nah, lad. I worry he's not powerful enough. There's horrible things afoot in the kingdoms. Those orcs are multiplying like rabbits. More sightings of trolls recently. And Medivh out hunting a demon as we speak. Bad times are coming. And I hope, well, I pray that he's up to it. We went 20 years without a guardian when he fell into his coma. I don't want to go another 20. So, when you asked how he is, you meant, how is he? Yeah. I don't want him weakening at a time like this. Orcs, trolls, demons. And then there's... You know the Guardian by now, I assume? Yes. And the Order? <laughs> no need to say it. Your eyes just gave you away. Never played cards with me, eh? Balls. But even asked Khadgar to make sure the King's Champion didn't learn too much. And yet it was becoming quite clear that Lothar basically already knew everything that Khadgar knew. Maybe even more. We wouldn't send for Med for a simple matter of magical misfire. Uglar and Agarin weren't the first to wind up being caught in their own spells. There was another. She met an accident two months back. All three, I believe, were members of your order. I, I don't think I'm comfortable speaking of this. Then don't. Three powerful mages. Dead. I can buy one. One mage being unlucky or being caught unawares. But three of them? Nah. Warrior doesn't believe in that much coincidence. And that's not even all. I got my ear to the ground. Spoken with people. Word comes from Ironforge, Alterac, even Lordaeron. There's been a plague of such mishaps. One after another. I think someone, or something, is hunting the great mages of this secret order. Khadgar realised Lothar was keenly studying his face. You think the Lord Mages is in danger? I think Medivh is danger incarnate. But yeah... Something's out there. It may be tied with the demons, or the orcs, or something much worse. And I would hate to lose our most powerful weapon at a time like this. Khadgar then tried to do a bit of face studying himself, but, unlike their first meeting at the Black Morass, the King's Champion had become almost unreadable. I'm sure he's fine. You're worried about him, and I share your concerns, but he's doing well. I doubt anyone or anything could truly hurt him. Lothar's eyes suggested he was about to say something else, but... A commotion nearby then interrupted their conversation. And then, Medivh swaggered into view. I thought I'd find you here taking afternoon tea. Bit of a creature of habit, aren't we, Lothar? Despite his smile, there was an almost drunken sway to Medivh. He looked absolutely knackered. And also, he appeared to be concealing something behind his back. Med, are you all right? The demon. Ah, yes. The demon. Medivh then revealed his bloody prize. A horned skull with a facial expression that seemed half in awe, half kind of pissed off, and lobbed it towards Lothar. You might want to have that stuffed. Had to burn the rest of it, of course. No telling what the inexperience might do with a draught of demon blood. You caught it pretty quick. Child's play. Once young Trust here pointed out how it fled the castle, it was simple enough to track. Very simple. All right then. Come on. We should tell the king. There'll probably be a feast in your honor for this, Med. You'll have to revel without us, I'm afraid. We have to get back. Isn't that right, Apprentice? Uh, of course. We, uh, left an experiment on the boil. But Eve flashed a glance at Khadgar before picking up the lie immediately. That we did. I'd forgotten about that with all this drama. Let's make like a tree and leaf, Apprentice. Apologies to his majesty, of course. Yeah, of course. But Eve then turned and walked off, but his whole demeanour seemed deflated. So, Khadgar quickly chased after him and grabbed his arm softly. What? Lord Magus, you look like shit. But Eve stared daggers for a brief moment before submitting and giving an aged nod. I've been better. Lothar probably noticed it too. I'd rather be home than here, young Trust. I was sick for a long time here. Don't wish to repeat that experience. Khadgar didn't say anything, simply nodded to his master. You're going to have to lead the way back to Karazhan. I, uh, could use a nap. <sighs> this is very important, Khadgar. I will be unavailable for a few days. If any messengers arrive, I want you to keep track of my correspondence. Sure, I can do that. No, you can't. 
That is why I need to tell you how to read the ones with the purple seal. Purple seal means it's order business. Medivh staggered down the steps, with Khadgar following closely behind to make sure his master didn't pass out and take a tumble. In the library, there's a scroll. The Song of Aegwin. The one Guzbar wants. Yes, that one. And this is why he can't have it. We use it as a cipher for order communications. It is the master key. Each member of the order has a copy. Take the standard alphabet, move everything down so the first letter is represented by the fourth, or the tenth, or the twentieth. It's a simple code. You understand? Khadgar opened his mouth to say yes, but Medivh was in too much of a rush to really give a shit. At the top of the message, we'll see what looks like a date. It's not. It's a reference to the stanza line and word you start at. The first letter of that word becomes the first letter of the alphabet in the code. From there, it proceeds normally. So the next letter in alphabetic progression would be the second letter, and so on. Okay. I get it. No, you don't. That's the cipher for the first sentence only. When you hit a punctuation mark, you will go to the second letter in the word. Then that becomes the first letter of the alphabet. And there's something else, but I'm missing it. The two then arrived outside Medivh's personal quarters, with Moreau's already there waiting for them, holding some pyjamas. What should I do, once I decipher the message? Right. Delay. Delay first. Day or two. I may be up after that. Then equivocate. I'm out on business or something. Don't tell them I'm indisposed. Last time I did that, an entire horde of would-be clerics arrived to minister my needs. I'm still missing silverware from that little visit. But Eve then took a deep breath and appeared to deflate even further, grabbing the door frame to stay upright. That fight with the demon was bad, wasn't it? I fought worse. How did you defeat it? I took its head off. But you didn't have a sword. Why would I need a sword? No, no more questions, Khadgar. We'll talk when I'm up to it. And with that, Medivh stepped into his room, and the ever-faithful Morose closed the door. A week passed, and Medivh had still not emerged from his quarters. Morose shuffled upstairs daily with a bowl of broth for the master, and on one occasion, Khadgar had summoned up the courage to follow him and take a little look-see. Medivh looked ghastly. His eyes weren't closed, but there was no light inside them, and his face was pale, thin, and haggard. Morose was literally spooning broth into his mouth, like he was some kind of vegetable. Was this another coma? Had Lothar's fears come to fruition? How long would the mages truly be out? On a daily basis, mail would arrive, but nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, it was all pretty boring. Reports, sketchings, articles about prominent wizards and what they like to do in their spare time. But eventually, a purple sealed letter did arrive. And Khadgar was immediately lost. Maybe he hadn't understood Medivh's instructions after all because the secret message he was coming out with quickly descended into absolute gibberish. But, after a day or so of frustration, Khadgar then realised what he'd been missing. The spaces between words were also considered a letter in the Order's cipher. And once the young man understood that, everything made sense. However, to say the secret message ended up being a little bit lacklustre was an understatement. No sign of orcs down here in the far south, although we have seen a rise in the number of jungle trolls. There's a new comet visible on the southern horizon. No need to reply. See you. Gagar then sat and wondered why the Order didn't use magical encoding or spell-based script. Perhaps not all members of the Order were wizards. Or perhaps they were just trying to make sure other mages couldn't read them. Like Guzbar, for example. Putting it in magical script would draw their curiosity like flies to shit. But the most likely explanation, Gadgar decided, was that Medivh was definitely the kind of bloke to force the rest of the Order to use a poem praising his mother as the key. A second week passed, and then a third. More letters arrived. It seemed the orcs had started to pour out of the Black Morass into surrounding areas, but the Master Mage was still comatose, and out of sheer boredom, Khadgar decided to start going through some of the older mail. Going through the old documents, Khadgar began to understand his master's somewhat ambivalent feelings towards the Order. A lot of the letters were little more than demands. Give me some enchantment. Come at once, because my cows aren't eating and their milk tastes weird. And Khadgar couldn't help but wonder why Medivh would ever bother helping these people. Vultures. The lot of them. However, there were some particular letters that caught Khadgar's eye, because they were so goddamned mysterious. Every now and then, he'd come across missives with no signature that simply said yes, or no, or the emu, of course. And his curiosity was piqued even further when a new letter arrived which simply said prepare quarters, the emissary will arrive shortly. At the end of the third week, even more letters arrived. Two, to be exact. One with a purple seal, the other a red one. And that one was addressed to Khadgar, so he opened that first. 
We regret to inform you of the sudden and unexpected death of the Instructor Mage Guzbar. We understand you had been in correspondence with the late Mage, and we share your emotion and sympathy at this time. If you have any correspondence, monies, or information currently due to Guzbar, please return it ASAP. Kind regards. Kadgar sank back, stunned, felt like he'd been punched in the gut. He sat in silence for a moment before reaching for the purple sealed envelope. Guzbar was found slain in the library on the eve of the Feast of Scribes. He was apparently taken by surprise from a beast which ripped him apart. The death was quick but painful. The letter continued, maintaining a cold, analytical tone that Kadgar found a little bit excessive. The letter noted that this was the seventh death within the year of a mage of the Violet Citadel, but was the first of this type where the victim was not a member of the Order itself. The writer seemed to want to know if Medivh had been in contact with Guzbar, either directly or through his apprentice, and then went on to speculate, or rather insinuate, the Guzbar had in fact been Kadgar's instructor at one point, and that was a little bit suspicious. How dare, Kadgar thought. What good could possibly come from casting accusations about like that, you dick? But the young mage then shook his head and took a deep breath. There wasn't much good to be gained from indignation either, really. His anger then faded to sadness, as he realised seven wizards of the Violet Citadel were now dead. They were powerless to stop this, and all this mysterious author could do was cast aspersions out of sheer desperation. Suddenly, an errant and unexpected breeze then wafted through the air, causing the hairs on the back of Kadgar's neck to bristle, and he turned round just in time to see a figure manifest within the room. It was no mistaking who it was, smaller so as to fit within the confines of the room, but just as imposing and intimidating as he had been in the vision a few chapters ago. It was Sargeras. However, the Demon Lord didn't say anything, simply moved through the tower and made his way to Medivh's room, so Kadgar followed him. The Lord of the Burning Legion then lingered at the foot of the Master Mage's bed and watched him sleep. Kadgar held his breath, sort of paralysed in fear, but the Demon Lord then raised a hand as if it was about to do something to the Mage's inert form, and without thinking, Kadgar lunged forward. Only he didn't end up striking Sargeras. He ran right through him and straight into a wall. Oh, Morose? Kadgar? Are you here? Kadgar picked himself up off the ground to see the demon had vanished and his master was awake. What are you doing on the floor, lad? Morose could have gotten you a cot or something. Master, your wards. They failed. A demon was here. A demon? I think not. The wards are still in place. What did you see? So, Kadgar quickly described the appearance of the demon whilst feigning ignorance that he knew exactly who it was. Sounds like another one of your visions. But the demon, the demon you described is no more. Slain before I was born, buried beneath the sea. You saw Sargeras. You've been using the Song of Aegwin to decipher messages, yes? Perhaps you were just having a nightmare. Look, tell you what, I will check the tower's mystic wards. I'll even show you how to do it. How's that? Now... Aside from that little bit of drama, anything happened whilst I was gone? Gadgar summarised the messages received, the rising tide of orc incidents, the mystery message about the emissary, and the news of Guzbar's death. Hmm. So they're going to play the blame game until the next poor sod gets sliced up. Typical. Feast of Scribes. That was before Hooklin and Hagarin died. By about a week and a half, yeah. Time enough for a demon to fly from Dalaran to Stormwind Keep. Or a man on Griffin back. It's not all demons and magic in this world. Sometimes a simpler answer suffices. Anything else? Sounds like these orcs are becoming much more numerous and dangerous. They've moved from caravan raids to full-blown attacks on settlements. Yes, everyone seems pretty concerned. I don't know what to expect next. On the contrary, if everything you tell me is true, then I'm afraid things are just the way I expected. With Medivh awake again, things return to normal or as normal as they could be, in the mystical tower of displaced time and magic and stuff. But Kadgar's training resumed, and all was right in the world. He learned how to control fire at will, summon lightning, cause small items to dance, but he also learned much more useful things, like a spell that allowed one to know when and how a man died, and the ability to either restore age to inanimate objects, or pull the youth from them. And as promised, Medivh also taught his apprentice the nature of protective wards, the Master Mage did disappear for brief periods every now and then though. He'd always leave instructions behind, but never an explanation as to where the bloody hell he was going. And every time he'd return, he'd always look like shit. But there was no further repeat of his comatose rest, so Kadgar figured whatever his master was doing, it probably had nothing to do with demons. Anyway, one evening, whilst studying in the library, Kadgar was disturbed by a whole bunch of commotion and loud noises. Coming down from below, 
but also outside. By the time he reached the window, all he could see was a group of riders disappearing off into the distance. What was all that about, he thought. So he made his way down the tower to ask Morose. However, as he reached the lower levels of the tower, he saw Morose on his way up, escorting someone. Kagar only caught a brief glance at the mysterious new person, clad in a black cloak, but they disappeared into a guest room before he could get any sort of real look at them. Other visitors, they were less careful. They're gone now. Whatever response the new arrival made, Khadgar didn't hear it, but Morose then closed the door to the guest room and turned to see the young apprentice coming towards him. A guest? I up. Major merchant. Dunno. Didn't ask. The emissary didn't say. The emissary? Oh. So it's political then? For the majors? Assume so. Didn't ask. Not my place. We'll be told when we need to know. And with that, Morose buggered off leaving Khadgar to stare at a closed door and wonder who the hell was behind it. For the next day, there was this real odd feeling in the tower. Khadgar had become accustomed to there usually only being three or four people in the entire place, including himself. But now there was a new person, a fifth person, an upstart, and it was weird. Didn't help that Medivh wasn't being very forthcoming with information. Khadgar tried to wait patiently to be told, tried dropping subtle hints like, So, what's, uh, what's new? But Medivh just looked him right in the eyes and told him to go and study, or practice his spells, or play on the motorway or something. So Khadgar stomped his way down the tower and racked his own brain to see if he could figure out who the emissary could possibly be. A spy? For Lothar, perhaps? A member of the Order? That dick from the Kirin Tor that accused Khadgar of being responsible for these murders? Or maybe it was just someone else entirely, who hasn't actually appeared in this story yet. Twas frustrating, not knowing. Twas frustrating not being trusted by the mages. However, a thought then popped into Khadgar's head, a mischievous thought. So the young apprentice stomped his way further down the tower until he reached one of the lesser used dining halls. He would not be discovered or disturbed here. And then he began casting his spell. Show me what's happening in Medivh's quarters. As the scene around him shifted, Khadgar almost immediately realized the spell hadn't exactly worked as planned again because he wasn't in Medivh's quarters. He was in some completely random place he'd never seen before in his life with some thin bloke, who he'd also never seen before in his life. Hey, you're awake. I've made breakfast. For a second, Khadgar thought this strange man was talking to him directly. But a woman then entered the scene, a woman he did recognize. Aegwyn. You seem to have gone to a great deal of trouble. Nihilus. Shh. Prepare yourself, my dear, for the greatest breakfast you've ever tasted. Berries picked from the royal gardens, butterfed ham and syrup. Nihilus. Poached eggs. I'm leaving. Leaving? So soon? I thought we could maybe spend the day. No, I'm leaving. I have my own tasks to complete. Not a lot of time for pleasantries of the morning after. But I thought after last night you'd want to stick around for a while. No, there's no need for me to stick around at all. I already got what I came for. Kagar winced. This wasn't going to be pretty. Um, but wow. You... Nihilus Aaron are an idiot. One of the mightiest sorcerers in the Order of Tirithfal, but an idiot. But hold on a minute. Surely you didn't think your natural charms alone brought me to your chamber? That your wit and sense of whimsy distracted me from our discussion of conjuration rites? You do realize that I wasn't impressed by your position as court conjurer like some simple village girl, yes? That seduction works both ways? You're not that big of an idiot, are you? Of course not. I just thought we might share a moment of breakfast. I'm as old as many dynasties. I got over my girlish indulgences early in my first century. I knew fully well what I was doing coming to your chambers last night. Aegwyn, I, th I thought... You thought what? You thought that you, of all the Order, would be the one to finally charm and tame the Great Wild Guardian? That you could break her to your will, where all the others had failed, with parlor tricks? Come on now, Nihilus. You've wasted much of your potential as it is. Don't tell me that life in the royal court has corrupted you utterly. Leave me some respect for you. So if you weren't impressed, if you didn't want me, then why did we... I came to Stormwind for one thing I could not provide myself. A suitable father to my heir. Yes, Nihilus Aaron, you can tell your fellow mages that you managed to bed the great and mighty guardian. But you will also have to explain to them that you provided me with a way of passing on my power without the Order having any further say in it. I... I did. Oh, you bloody... The Order's gonna be furious. Yep. They won't act against you, though. Don't worry. 
just in case I truly do have some romantic interest in you. Take solace. Of all the mages, wizards, conjurers and sorcerers, you were the one with the most potential. Your seed will protect and strengthen my child and make him the vessel for my power. And when he's born and weaned, you will even raise him. Here. I know he'll follow my path, and I'm sure the Order would like a chance to influence him. Did you... Oh. Goodbye, Magna Aegwin. Goodbye, Nihilus Aaron. It was... pleasant. And with that, Aegwin buggered off, leaving Nihilus Aaron, chief conjurer to the throne of Azeroth, member of the Order of Tirisfal, and now father to the future guardian Medivh, stood in his kitchen, all on his lonesome. The vision then faded around Khadgar, and as it did, a noise from behind startled the young apprentice, followed by the soft scraping of a cloak and the cloppity-clop of someone cheesing it. Khadgar turned and caught a flash of the emissary's cloak exiting the room, so he gave chase. And soon enough, he caught up with the cloaked figure, grabbed the fabric, and yanked. The Major saw one I know, your spy- Khadgar's mouth then dropped, wide open, as he saw the person beneath the cloak. Or Orc! Orc! The emissary went ahead and kicked Khadgar right in the balls, and as we all know, that pretty much stops a man from being able to do or say anything. However, Morose then appeared from around a corner. You are right, Emissary. Never better. Needed a little exercise. The whelp was kind enough to oblige. Khadgar had absolutely no idea what the hell was going on, but he managed to spit out some words. Morose, this woman is... The Emissary. Guest of the Mages. He wants to see you, by the way. Khadgar pulled himself to his feet and looked sharply at the female orc. Make sure you tell him you've been snooping around. Doesn't want to see her. Wants to see you, apprentice. She's an orc. Half orc, actually. I surmise her homeworld has humans. Or near humans. Or at least had them within living memory. Hand me the calipers, will you? They tried to kill you, master. And me. Orcs, you mean? Some orcs did try to kill us, yes. But I don't recall seeing Garona there. She wasn't in that group, was she? She's here as a representative for her people. Or, at least, some of her people. Garona. So that witch has a name, does she? Khadgar thought. Prejudice me. Look, we were attacked by orcs. I had a vision of attacks of orcs. I've been reading communications from all over about raids and attacks by orcs. Every mention of them speaks of cruelty and violence. They're dangerous and savage. She kicked you in the balls, didn't she? That's beside the point. Right. So, what is your point? She's an orc. Dangerous. Savage. And she's just wandering around the tower. Half orc. She's about as dangerous as you are, young trust. And she's my guest. So I would appreciate it if you treat her with a little bit more respect. Kagar sighed, and then tried a new approach. So she's the emissary. Yes. For who? Who's she the emissary for? One or more of the clans currently inhabiting the Black Morass. Not quite sure which ones yet. We haven't got that far. So you led her into our tower, and yet she has no official standing. But Eve then let out a weary sigh. She's presented herself to me as a representative of some of the orc clans that are presently raiding Azeroth. If this matter is going to be solved, then someone has to start talking. And by the way, this is considered my tower, not ours. You are my student here, my apprentice, and you're here at my whim. And as my apprentice, I expect you to keep an open mind. There was a bit of silence, but I don't think Hadgar calmed down much. So she represents whom? Some, none, or all of the orcs. For the moment, she represents herself. Not all humans believe the same thing. There's no reason to believe all orcs do, either. Here's a question for you, Khadgar. With your natural curiosity, why are you not already trying to pull as much information out of her as possible? Instead of telling me I should not do the same. Do you doubt me? My abilities to handle a single half-orc? Again, silence. And Khadgar felt that now familiar warm feeling around his face cheeks. I worry about you at times. I seem to be worrying about a lot of things these days. Sir, I think Garona's a spy. I think she's here to learn as much as she can to be used against you later. There, I said it. But Eve then glanced directly at Khadgar and a wicked smile formed on his face. That is very much the pot calling the kettle black, young mageling. Or have you forgotten the very reason you were sent here in the first place? After his little argument with Medivh, Khadgar returned to the library to find Garona snooping around again, this time checking over Khadgar's various notes, and an immediate rage blossomed in his chest. But Khadgar then remembered what it felt like to be kicked in the balls, so he calmed down a little bit. What are you doing? 
Snooping. Spying. Corona then looked up at Khadgar and frowned. I'm just trying to understand what you're doing here. You left your notes out in the open. Hope this is alright with you. It is not alright with me, Khadgar thought. But he didn't say it. Lord Medivh has instructed me to extend to you every courtesy. However, he may take umbrage. If in doing so, I allow you to blow yourself up casting some ill-thought magical spell. I have no interest in magic. Famous last words. Is there something I can help you with? Or are you just snooping in general? I was told you had a tome on Azeroth Kings. I'd like to consult it. I'm surprised you can read. Second row. Fourth shelf up. It's a red-bound book with gold trim. Corona disappeared into the stacks, and Khadgar took the opportunity to gather up his notes. He'll have to keep them elsewhere now. Now that the half-orc could free run of the place. At least he hadn't left order correspondence lying around. Or the Song of Aegwyn. Might be worth moving that scroll as well though. Just in case. Groner then returned and raised an eyebrow at Khadgar. Yeah, that's the one. Human languages are a bit... wordy. Only because we always have something to say. Khadgar then found himself wondering if orcs had books. Could they all read? He knew they had spellcasters. After that night he was nearly killed by one. But... Did that mean they had real knowledge? Oh, and the balls. Never better. Groda then sat down and began to read the big book about kings, and Khadgar noted that she'd immediately turned towards the back of it, to the recent editions about King Lane's reign. So, you're an emissary. Corona nodded, but was still mostly concentrating on the book. Who are you emissarying for, exactly? At that, Corona did look up, and Khadgar noted a flicker of irritation on her face. Good, he thought. I'm glad I'm bothering you. However, the young apprentice knew he didn't want to push too hard, otherwise he might piss Medivh off, or get another kick in the balls. I mean, if you're an emissary, that means someone's giving you orders. Someone you have to report back to. So who's that? I'm sure your master the old man would tell you if you asked. I'm sure he would, if I had the effrontery to ask him. So I ask you instead. Who do you represent? What powers have you been granted? Are you here to negotiate, or demand, or what? Corona then closed the book, and Khadgar felt a small sense of victory for distracting her from it. Do all humans think alike? It would be boring if we did. So not everyone agrees about everything. Do humans always agree to what their masters or superiors want? Hardly. One reason there's so many tomes in here is that everyone has an opinion. So understand that there's a difference of opinions among orcs as well. The Horde is made up of a number of clans, with their own chieftains and war leaders. All orcs belong to a clan. What are the clans? What are they called? Storm Reavers 1, Black Rock, Twilight's Hammer, Bleeding Hollow. Those are the major ones. All sounds very... aggressive. Our homeland is a harsh place. Only the strongest survive. The Orcs are no more than what their land made them. Kaka then thought back to the first vision he'd had in this tower. A red-skied wasteland. So that was the Orc world, was it? But how did they get here? He wondered. How did I get there? But instead, he asked, What's your clan? <clears throat> I have no clan. You said all of your people belong to one. I said all orcs. Corona noted that Khadgar was looking at her blankly, as if to say, what's the difference? So she extended her hand. What do you see? Your hand. Human or orc? Orc. It was obvious. Green skin, sharp nails, big knuckles. Yet an orc would say it's a human hand. Too slender to be useful. Not enough muscle to hold an axe. Too pale. Too weak. Too ugly. You see the parts of me that are orcish. The orcs see the parts of me that are human. I'm both, and yet neither. Considered inferior by both sides. Khadgar opened his mouth to argue, but then thought better of it. He hadn't liked hearing it, but she wasn't wrong. It must be difficult. There's advantages. I can move between clans more easily. Disliked by all, so no one suspects me of being biased. Makes me a better negotiator. And yeah, before you say it, a better spy. Better to have no allegiance than conflicting ones. Khadgar thought back to the Kirin Tor and his conflicting allegiances. So which clan do you represent at the moment? If I said Jizbla the Mighty, what would you say? Would that mean anything to you? It, it might. It shouldn't, because I just made that name up. The name of the faction that sent me here would mean nothing to you. Just as King Lane means nothing to the Orcs. Before we can have peace, before we can even start negotiations, we have to learn more about you. Which is why you're here. Exactly. So forgive me for praying that you'll leave me alone long enough for me to do that. Corona then opened the book again, but Khadgar wasn't done. 
That goes both ways, though. And Garona closed the book with an exasperated breath. I mean, we're going to need to know more about the orcs as well, if you're serious about peace. Garona glared at Khadgar, and the young apprentice felt the immediate need to shield his balls, but the half-orc's ears then perked up. Hold on. What was that? Khadgar then felt what Garona must have felt. A sudden change in the air. A wave of warmth passing through the tower, followed by the sounds of iron claws scraping against stone. And then, a giant beast slouched into the library. Your manservant said there were visions here. Ghosts. Is this one? Khadgar shook his head. Visions tended to encompass the entire area. The beast remained in the doorway, sniffing the air. Was it blind? Khadgar wasn't going to wait to find out. Get to the high tower. We have to warn Medivh. Corona nodded, and then slowly shifted to one side, and that slight movement was enough to cause all hell to break loose. The creature pounced in her direction, causing Khadgar to instinctively fire off a bolt of mystic energy towards the beast. The energy ripped through its chest, causing the demon to tumble a bit, but it was still very much alive and kicking. Get Medivh! Go! But what if it wants me? It doesn't. It kills mages. But you... Just go! However, Corona didn't go, which was annoying. I said go! There's no time. You'll be ripped to pieces before I even make it up two flights of stairs. Corona then pounced into action herself, pulling out a dagger, and Khadgar found himself slightly relieved as she began stabbing the beast, but also slightly suspicious as to why she had a dagger in the first place. But still, the demon remained standing, snapping its maw and doing demon things and stuff. Run! So Khadgar did. He ran like the wind. Didn't know where he was going, but he ran. But... Not really having a destination in mind resulted in him running down an aisle within the library that had no exit, and he was now trapped as the demon came bounding up behind him. However, a whole bunch of deep crashes then resounded, and Khadgar watched stunned as the demon was crushed by the domino effect of the library's bookshelves. Khadgar, here. Did we get it? Khadgar was still a little bit in shock by everything that had just happened, so he didn't respond. So, Garona took a little look-see beneath the pile of bookshelves, to see some green goo pooling on the floor and a clawed outstretched hand poking out that wasn't moving at all. Looks like we got it. Why didn't you listen? You should have gone for Medivh. Beast would have killed you. Kangar nodded and then came to his senses. The mages. Surely he heard all of this. Yeah, should have. We made enough noise to wake the dead. Oh crap, what if there was more than one demon? Come on. So the two of them went rushing up the tower only to find Medivh standing quite contently in his observatory. Oh, thank God. There's a demon in the tower. Oh, not this again. Your student is correct. I was in the library with him when it attacked. It was probably nothing more than a vision. They happen here. Moroz warned you about them, yes? It wasn't a vision, Master. Something got past my wards. Ridiculous. No, none of the wards are even tripped. You're here. Cook's in the kitchen. Moroz is in the hall outside the library. Nothing is amiss. Come with us, Master. Come and see. Must I? I have other things to worry about. Please. We believe the beast is dead, and we don't want to risk the lives of your servants on our beliefs. Ah, fine. As you wish. Upon returning to the library, they found Morose standing there, dustpan and broom in hand. He didn't look happy. Congratulations. I think it's a bigger mess now than when you first arrived. At least then I had shelving. Where is this supposed demon? Khadgar walked over to the spot where the demon had been crushed, but all that remained was the wreckage of the bookshelves and things. No outstretched clawed hand, no pool of green goo. It was there. We both saw it. You saw a vision. Rose, did you tell her about the visions? I, I did. And you wouldn't happen to have a demon corpse in that dustbin, would you? Don't believe so. I can check for you. No, Rose. <laughs> Don't worry. Leave your tools for these two, good sir. In light of this, you two get to straighten up the library. Young trust you have betrayed your name. But I saw... We saw a phantom. We saw a piece of somewhere else. Would not have harmed you. It never does. Your friend here tends to see demons where there are none. That worries me a bit. Perhaps you can try not to see any whilst you're cleaning up. And with that, Medivh buggered off. And Morose laid his dustpan and broom on the floor and also buggered off. This was no illusion. I know. So why doesn't he see it? That I don't know. And I worry about finding out the answer. It didn't take weeks to clean the library this time. Only several days. Because Khadgar had Corona to help and stuff. But other than the damage wrought during the fracas, 
there was still no trace of the demon that caused it. Maybe it was rescued. It was pretty dead when we left it. How do you rescue a corpse? Maybe the same person who popped it in here popped it out. And all the blood as well. Well, maybe it was a tidy demon. That's not the way magic works. Perhaps not your magic. Other peoples could have other magics. There's a big difference between the old shaman of the orcs and the warlocks. Maybe it was just a spell you've never heard of. No, it would have left some kind of marker. Some piece of the caster behind. I'd be able to feel that residual energy even if I couldn't identify it. The only spellcasters that have been active in this tower are myself and the mages. And I've checked the wards. But Eve was right. They're all operating. Nobody should have been able to break into the tower. Magic or otherwise. Khadgar's relationship with the half-orc had seemed to have improved over their recent experiences. But Garona still seemed somewhat guarded about whom she represented. And as a result, Khadgar had remained watchful. So watchful, in fact, that he'd wrapped her guest quarters with a whole bunch of detection spells. If she left her room during unsociable hours, or sent communications out, he'd know about it. But Grona had started being a little bit more candid about the orcs in general with Khadgar during their time together. A large chunk of the orcish nation known as the Horde were the conservative Bleeding Hollow clan. They had a long history of conquest, but their leader, Kilrog Deadeye, was getting on a bit, and had become more unwilling to throw lives away in combat in recent years. Grona explained that in orcish politics, Older orcs become wiser orcs, more pragmatic, which is often mistaken for cowardice by the younger generations. Kilrog had already had to kill three of his sons and two grandsons due to them trying to usurp his rule and stuff. Another clan, known as the Black Rock, was another large chunk of the Horde. Its leader was called Blackhand, and he was a dick. And a portion of that clan had recently splintered off, knocked out a tooth, and were now calling themselves the Blacktooth Grin, which seemed dumb to Khadgar, but what else? Other clans, Twilight's Hammer, reveled in destruction, and the Burning Blade, which seemed to have no leader, opting for more of an anarchy system instead. And then there were the Storm Reavers, that were led by a warlock. Garona was so vague about that particular clan that Khadgar surmised she was probably reporting to someone within it. But any little tidbit that Garona shared, Khadgar would note down and assemble into reports for Lothar. The orcs were full on spilling out of the Black Morass now, and could no longer be ignored. Stormwind Keep were preparing to mobilise against them, so Khadgar figured they were going to need as much information as they could get, no matter how trivial the details might seem. Khadgar also tried to share his findings with Medivh, but the Master Magus was surprisingly disinterested. In fact, he was surprisingly disinterested about most things. Even Morose would flash Khadgar the odd knowing glance, as if to say, Master's being a bit of an asshole, isn't he? But on one particular evening, Khadgar had head up to the observatory to report to the Magus on a whole bunch of purple sealed messages that had arrived, all begging for aid against the orcs. The orcs are not demons. They are flesh and blood. The worry of warriors, not wizards. The messages are quite dire. Sounds like the lands closest to the Black Morass have been abandoned. There are refugees flooding into Stormwind. They're pressed thin. And so they depend on the Guardian to ride to their rescue. Bad enough I must guard the watchtowers of the Twisting Nether, hunt down the mistakes of these amateurs. Now I must rescue them against other nations. Will I be asked to help with trade disputes next? Such matters are beneath me. But, sir, Lothar is... Lothar is a fool. An old mother hen that sees threats everywhere. And Lane is little better, seeing nothing that could break his walls. And the Order, all those mighty mages that have quarrelled and argued and spat amongst themselves for eons. Now they don't even have the power to repel a new invader. No, young Trust. This is the little stuff. If the orcs succeed, they will need a guardian. And I will be here for them. Master, that's... Sacrilege. Blasphemy. Betrayal. Perhaps. I am a man made old before my time, and I have paid a great price for my unwanted power. Permit me to rail against the clockworks that rule my life. Go. Leave me. I'll return to your sob stories in the morning. So, Khadgar made his way out of the room, but not before hearing Medivh mumble something else to himself. I'm so tired of worrying about everything. When can I worry about myself? Khadgar slammed the missive down on the table. The orcs have attacked Stormwind. Sorry, they're not likely to take prisoners. They were repelled this time, thrown back before they reached the gates by Lane's troops. There seemed to be a lack of coordination between the Bleeding Hollow and Twilight's Hammer forces. Ha, <laughs> Kilrog was trying to decimate a rival and use Stormwind as an anvil to do it. So even in the midst of an attack, they continue to brawl and betray each other. Very much like humans. 
In your histories, there are continual justifications for all manner of hellish actions. Claims of nobility and heritage and honor to cover up genocides and massacres. At least the Horde is honest in their naked lust for power. Corona then fell silent for a moment. I don't think I could have helped them. The Orcs or Stormwind, either. I didn't know about this, if that's what you're hinting at. Although in hindsight, the Orcs do have a tendency to strike the biggest target first. But you know from our discussions that the Horde will pull back, regroup, kill a few leaders and then come back in greater numbers. Yeah, I figured as much. And you've already sent a report to the Champion of Stormwind to that effect. Kadgar's face cheeks felt warm again. So what if I have? The real question is, why haven't you been reporting back to your masters? Who's to say I haven't? I do, unless you're a better mage than I am. You haven't been reporting back at all, have you? <sighs> Let's just say I've been having a problem with divided loyalties. I thought you had no allegiances. Garona ignored Kadgar's little snide comment and continued, I was sent here, ordered here, by a warlock named Gul'dan, leader of the Storm Reavers. Very influential in the Horde, and very interested in the mages of your world and the Orcs have a tendency to strike the biggest target first, Medivh. Gul'dan said Medivh was special. How he came to that conclusion, I don't know. But I met with the Major several times in the field, and then agreed to come here as an emissary. I was supposed to trade basic information and then report back to Gul'dan as much as I could. So you were right from the start. I was here as a spy. You wouldn't have been the first. So why didn't you report back? Medivh, the old man, he saw through it all. And yet he still told me what I wanted to know. Yeah, he did the same thing to me. At first I thought, maybe he was just being pompous. So sure of himself. And then I realised, it's as if he feels that by giving me the knowledge, he knew I'd be changed by it. That I wouldn't betray his trust. Trust. <laughs> That's a big thing for him. He seems to exude it. He put a lot of trust in me. He puts it in you too, you know. When I saw your vision power thing, I told him about it. He said he knew, and it didn't bother him. Though you were naturally curious and it served you well. He stands by his people, and you can't hurt someone like that. Yeah, he made me feel human, and I haven't felt human in a very long time. The two then sat in silence for a while. Has he ever been like this before? He's always been erratic, eccentric, and I've never seen him this depressed. Up to now, I always assumed he'd be on the side of the Kingdom of Stormwind, but to see it attacked and still he does nothing, it may be his own training. Kagar decided to choose his next words carefully. He didn't want to reveal the order to Garona. He has to take a very long view on things. Sometimes it cuts him off from others. Which is why he takes in strays, I suppose. I'm not sorry that Stormwind repelled the invaders. You don't destroy something like that from without. You have to weaken the walls from within first. Well, I'm glad you're not there as a general. Chieftain. <laughs> like I'd get a chance. There is something... Kadgar stopped mid-sentence, and Garona tilted her head towards him. Go on, ask your favour. The soldiers at Stormwind were amazed by the sheer number of orcs in the attack. It almost seems impossible that the swamps of the Black Morass could hold that many. Oh, I don't know anything about troop disposition. I've been here spying on you, remember? True, but you've spoken of your homeland. How did you get from there to here? Was it some kind of spell? Garona then went quiet for a moment, deep in contemplation. Kadgar expected her to respond with some flippant comment, but she then went ahead and told him a whole bunch of things. We call our world Dranor. It's a savage land. Inhospitable. And stormy. With a red sky. You've spoken to other orcs? No. I saw it in a vision. Like the one you witnessed back when we first met. Your visions probably reveal more than you realise, but you have a good picture. It was a hard life, where only the strong and smart and powerful survived. And then, the order went out. The order? We were put on the march. Every warrior in capable hand. Pack up your weapons, tools, belongings, and head for Hellfire Peninsula. And when we arrived, we saw it. A great portal that broke the space between worlds. Udan promised us a world of riches, food, water. A world of soft creatures that would be easily dominated. It was a no-brainer, so we all just poured through. I have no idea how many orcs were there. It was chaos. And I have no idea where that portal even came from. But you, Gadgar, you might be able to find out. Me? Your visions. You seem to be able to summon them. Maybe you can summon up the moment when the rift was first created. 
You could find out who brought the orcs here. That's actually a really good idea. So, after descending some stairs and making a few preparations, Kadgar and Garona were in one of the lesser-used dining halls, ready to summon a vision. I warn you, this rarely works as intended. You'll do well. I believe in you. I mean, I'll probably get something. I just don't know what. Show me the origin of the rift between Dranor and Azeroth. The scene shifted, and both Kadgar and Garona now found themselves in someone's quarters. And that someone was tossing and turning in their bed, before sitting bolt upright as if waking from a nightmare. Gul'dan. It's okay. He can't see us. I can see you. Come forth, dream creature. Grona gripped Kadgar's shoulder, as they both kind of shit themselves, but Gul'dan wasn't talking to them. Instead, a new spectre wafted into view. Gul'dan, I want your people. I want your armies. I want your power to aid me. Who and what are you, truly? You fear me, and you do not understand me. See my world and then understand your fear. Kagar and Garona then sort of stood there, as Gul'dan looked around the room like a crazy person, making all sorts of, oh, and oh, noises. Gather your forces, gather your armies, and warriors, and laborers, and allies. Prepare them for a journey through the Twisting Nether. Prepare them well, for all I have shown you will be yours when you succeed. Kagar shook his head. He knew the voice. He knew who this was. He just didn't want to accept it. I shall do so. But who are you? I am the Guardian. You can call me Medivh. No! The vision disappeared, leaving Kadgar and Garona alone in the dining hall once more. And Kadgar then fell to his knees. The old man. It couldn't be. It can be. Kadgar's stomach was in knots, his mind racing. No, it must be a misfire, a false vision, complete bollocks. You said yourself, they rarely work as intended. Not like that. It rarely shows what I asked for, but it always shows the truth. Well, perhaps it's just a warning. It makes sense. Think about it. That's why the wards were still intact. He's already here. But it didn't seem like him. Maybe it was some illusion. Some magical fakery. Kagar looked at Garona. She was trembling, and there were tears pooling in her eyes. She wanted to believe, desperately. I know the master's voice. I know the master's face. In all his moods and manners. But it was like someone else was wearing that face. Something false. Maybe he was just tricking that orc, convincing him to come here. But why? Why would Medivh want to bring the orcs to Azeroth? I don't know. It sure as hell explains why he hasn't done much to oppose them, though. Why he doesn't give a shit. <sighs> we need to find out. He's the Guardian. Can't just condemn him on a single vision. Corona nodded. So what do we do? Just ask him. Before Kadgar could respond, another voice sounded through the halls. What's going on? What are you children up to? Kadgar turned to see Medivh standing in the doorway, and the young apprentice immediately found himself struggling to think of an answer. So, Garona went ahead and answered for him. The apprentice was showing me a spell he was working on. Ugh, oh, another of your visions, young trust. They're bad enough around here without you calling up more. Come out of there at once. We have work to do. You as well, Emissary. Medivh's voice was measured and understanding, but also firm. So Kadgar went to take a step forward and obey his master, but Garona grabbed him by the arm. Shadows. Kadgar then blinked and looked back at the mages in the doorway. Corona was right. Trailing behind him was not one shadow, but two. What's the matter with you? We should, uh, clean up our mess. Don't want to make Moreau's work too hard. We'll catch up with you. Negotiation's not part of an apprentice's duties. Come here at once. However, no one moved, and Corona tugged on Kadgar's arm once again. Why doesn't he come into the room? Why indeed, Kadgar thought. But instead, he said, One question, Master. Ah, oh, what? Why did you visit the Orc Gul'dan's dreams? Why did you show them how to come to this world? Medivh shifted his glare to Garona. Hmm, I was unaware Gul'dan told you of me. It didn't strike me as being unwise. Or a chatterbox. I didn't know. Until now. <laughs> it matters little. Now come here, both of you. Why did you show the Orcs the way here? You do not negotiate with your betters. Why did you bring the orcs to Azeroth? It is none of your business, child. You will come here now. 
The Mages' face was now absolutely livid. With respect, sir, no, I will not. Child, I will have you! However, as the Eve stepped into the room, sparks started flying all over the place, causing the Mages to stagger back. The hell was that? Circle of warding. To keep summoned demons at bay. He can't cross it. Why not? Unless... No. So it was you. You killed Huglar and Agarin, and Guzbar, and the others. Why? Did they figure things out? They were further from the truth than you are, child. But I had to be careful. Medivh then attempted to step forward again, grunting at the resistance from the protective ward. I forgave your curiosity for your youth, and I thought that loyalty... <clears throat> that loyalty still mattered in this world! The wards blazed as Medivh moved into them, setting his beard on fire. He's gonna get through. We need to get out of here. Only way out is past him. Blow out a wall then. New exit. Khadgar looked around the room but then shook his head. We'll do something. So Khadgar did do something. Calming himself, he drew on the surrounding magical energies and said, Bring me a vision of one who has fought this beast before. The scene then shifted with Khadgar and Garona now finding themselves in the observatory atop the tower. You dare strike your own mother? Aegwyn stood at one end of the deck, with a past Medivh standing at the other. And Khadgar then kind of shit himself as he realised the present incarnation of Medivh was also with them in this vision, sort of sparkling away inside one of the walls. Mother, I thought you were being hysterical. So a mystic bolt would bring me to my senses? Answer my question. You're not seeing things right. Answer! Why did you bring the orcs to Azeroth? No wonder he was being so testy when you asked him that. Mother, you don't have an answer, do you? This is some little game you're playing. The power of the Tyrus Fallen is no game, child. How do you account for yourself? Khadgar half expected past Medivh to just cheese it from his mother, but instead, the Major simply started to laugh. Does your mother's disapproval amuse you, child? No, but my mother's stupidity does. You dare? I do, mother. And I have the power for it. The power you invested me with at my conception. A power I did not want or request. But why? Why did you let the orcs into Azeroth? There was no need. You've put entire populations at risk and to what end? To break the cycle, of course. To smash the clockwork universe that you've built for me. Everything in its place, including your child. If you could not continue on as guardian, your hand-picked born and groomed successor would. But would be locked into his script as tightly as any of your other pawns. But the risk, child. Risk? Risk to whom? Certainly not to me. Not with the power of the Tyrus Fallon at my command. The Order worry more about internal politics than demons, and the human nations are all fat and happy, protected from dangers they don't even know about. Is anyone important really at risk? You're playing with forces greater than yourself! Oh, of course. Thinking I could handle powers like that would be the sin of pride, wouldn't it? Sort of like thinking you could match wits with the Lord of the Burning Legion and come out on top, eh, Mother? What happens if these orcs succeed? They worship dark gods and shadows. Why would you give Azeroth to them? When they succeed, they will make me their leader. They respect strength, Mother, unlike the rest of this sorry world. And thanks to you, I'm the strongest thing in this world. I will have broken the shackles that you and others have placed on me, and I will rule. There was some awkward silence for a bit. Until Egwin broke it. You are not my son. No, I've never been your son. Not truly, in any case. Past Medivh then started to laugh, but it wasn't his usual little titter. It was a much deeper thunderous laugh, one that Egwin immediately recognised. Sargeras, but I killed you. You killed a body, witch, but I was willing to sacrifice it to gain a greater prize. Despite herself, Aegwyn placed a hand on her stomach. Yes, mother dear. I hid in your womb, passed into the slumbering cells of your unformed child. Killing you was impossible. Seducing you? Unlikely. So I made myself your heir. Aegwyn cried out a curse and hurled a bolt of energy at the Medivh Sargeras creature, but it simply raised a hand and caught the energy, then invoked a spell of its own and sent Aegwyn flying across the room. I cannot kill you, mother. Some part of me keeps me from doing that, but I will break you and banish you, and by the time you've healed and returned here, this land will be mine." The vision then dissipated, and present-day Medivh fell to his knees and let out a huge howl, which was a bit weird. 
It seemed he was screaming to the heavens for a forgiveness that he would never receive. That's our cue. Run! So Khadgar did. Both he and Garona pushed past the screaming, sobbing Medivh in the doorway and made their way down the stairs, almost slamming directly into Morose. Excited? Problem? The master's gone mad, Morose. More than usual. It's not a joke. Do you have the whistle to summon griffins? I yep. Wish me to summon. I'll do it. He'll be after us, but you'd better run as well. Take Cook. Get as far away as you can. And with that, Khadgar and Garona buggered off. Flee? Where would I even go? Khadgar and Garona made it several miles from the tower before the griffins started to misbehave. Only a single beast had answered Khadgar's summons, and it was not happy about having to carry a half-orc on its back. So there's a scoop for you. Griffin's a racist. But anyway, the young apprentice had tried tilting the griffin in the direction of Stormwind, but it was now bucking beneath them, trying to turn around and head back to the mountains. What's wrong with it? Medivh's calling it back. Khadgar wrestled with the reins a little more, but it was time to admit defeat. So they landed, and the racist griffin immediately buggered off to return to the call of its master. Do you think Medivh will follow? I don't want to stick around and find out. Let's head to Stormwind. And so they did. They stumbled down a dirt track for most of the evening, heading in the general direction of Stormwind. The countryside was littered with smashed overturned carts, houses burned to their foundations, clumps of newly hummocked earth that marked buried families. It was awful. Old people have been thorough. They pride themselves on such matters. Pride. In destruction. <laughs> you wouldn't find any human army burning down everything in its path and killing animals without purpose. Garona nodded, sarcastically. It is the Orc way. Don't leave anything standing that your foes could use against you. These are not resources. These are lives. This land was once green. Fields and forests. Now it's a wasteland. Look at it. Can there be any peace between humans and orcs? Grona said nothing, and the two of them then continued on in silence, until eventually they came across the shambles of an inn, and decided it was probably time to have a little bit of a sleep. Neither of them had any interest in sharing a room with each other though, so Khadgar slept in the wreckage of the common room, whilst Garona lay down in the kitchen. However, a few hours later, Khadgar was awakened by the growls of his own stomach. They'd fled the tower so quickly they hadn't exactly had time to pack provisions. He'd not eaten in over a day. So he picked himself up off the damp straw he was using as a bed, and went for a wander. How was he going to get someone like Garona into Stormwind, he thought. They should probably find her some kind of disguise or something. Did she even want to go to Stormwind? Now that she was free of the tower, maybe she was planning on going back to Gul'dan and the Stormreaver clan. Something then moved nearby, but Khadgar wasn't too bothered by the sound. Probably just Garona. She had to be pretty hungry too. In fact, maybe she'd found some food. So Khadgar head towards the sound, but as he turned the corner, he found himself now standing with the edge of an axe leveled at his neck. What's that? Balls. That's not Garona. That's an orc. A real orc. So, Khadgar slowly raised his hands, only to feel something heavy land on the back of his head, and then the world went black. Khadgar wasn't out long, although it had been long enough for a half dozen other orcs to have now arrived, but as he stirred, one of the orcs turned towards him. What's your stuff? Where are you headed? I'm sorry, what? Your stuff. You got nothing. Where are you hiding? No stuff. Lost it earlier. No stuff. <sighs> Then you die. No! Khadgar turned to see Garona. Get out, half-breed. None of your business. You're killing my property. That makes it my business. Property? Who's you to have property? I am Garona half orcan I serve Gul'dan. Damage my property and you'll have to deal with him. Storm Reavers. <sighs> Weak clan. Um, I'm just gonna- Down, slave! Speak when you're spoken to and not before. The lead orc took a step forward, but in one swift motion, Corona had her blade pointed right at his midsection, so he backed away again. He's mine! The orc looked at her, then at Khadgar, then back at Corona, then back at Khadgar, and then back to Corona again. Ain't nothing worth fighting for anyway, half-breed. And with that, the orc leader walked off, with his subordinates following. Alright, they're gone. You didn't have to hit me. You idiot of a pale skin. If I hadn't knocked you down, the orc leader would have killed you outright, and then turned on me because I couldn't keep you in line. Did you have to hit me that hard, though? To convince them, yes. Not that I didn't enjoy it. A short time later, after Corona and Khadgar were certain the previous drama was well and truly over, they set out on the road again, 
heading for Stormwind. But at about midday, they came across the gang of orcs once again. Only this time, they were missing their heads and were kind of dead and stuff. Groner quickly moved from body to body, pulling salvageable gear from them, whilst Khadgar scanned the horizon. Are you going to help me? In a moment. As soon as I know that whatever killed our friends is not still around. Khadgar then pointed out the hoof prints on the ground. Cavalry. Human cavalry. So we're getting close at least. I've been thinking. Huh. I wonder how many human disasters start with that line. We're within range of Stormwind patrols. I don't think Medivh is following us. So maybe we should split up. I thought of that. And no. I don't think we should. No one's in control of this area. Human or orc. You might walk 50 yards away and hit another patrol of my people, and I might get ambushed by yours. If we're together, there's a better chance of survival. One is the other's slave. Prisoner. What? Humans don't take slaves. Sure you do. You just have a different name for it. We're staying together. And that's it? Yeah. Well, there's one more thing. And what's that? We need to burn the bodies. It's the least we can do. But the smoke will draw attention. I know. But it's the right thing to do. If you found human soldiers killed in an ambush, wouldn't you want to bury them? Ah, <sighs> fine. So the two of them got to work, and within an hour, they'd stripped the bodies and set the remains ablaze, and then they set off again. They travelled for an entire day, passing even more countryside and shiz. However, at one point, they did have to hole up inside a mostly intact farmhouse, whilst a small army of orcs marched by. Idiots. You what? They couldn't be more exposed. This lot doesn't have an objective. They're just looking for a fight. You don't think much of your people. I don't think much of any people right now. The orcs disown me. The humans will kill me. And the only human I really trusted turned out to be a demon. Well, there's me. Oh, yeah, there's you. But I thought... I really thought that Medivh was going to make a difference. But he's just another madman. Maybe that's all I'm good for. Working for madmen. Maybe I'm just another pawn in the game. Your role is whatever you choose it to be. Another day of walking passed, and the two of them entered an abandoned town. The buildings were a lot more whole than previous ones they'd seen, but still, the entire place was deserted. So, Khadgar went ahead and broke into a nearby shop, and came across some potatoes. He'd never been so happy to see potatoes. Khadgar's mind then raced about what the next step actually was. Could Medivh be reasoned with? Convinced to shut the portal? Or was it too late? At least they now knew of the portal. If the humans could locate it, they may be able to shut it. Cut the orcs' reinforcements from Dranor off. However, the apprentice was pulled from his thoughts by a commotion outside, and as he rushed out of the shop, he found a patrol of human footmen and Corona being restrained as a sergeant backhanded her across the face. Where are the others? Leave her alone. The sergeant turned to see Khadgar approaching. Who are you? This is a military matter, boy. I'm Khadgar, apprentice to Medivh the Magus, friend and ally to your King Lane. I have business with him. Take us at once to Stormwind. Oh yeah, of course. Sure you are. And I'm Lord Lothar. Medivh doesn't take apprentices, everyone knows that. And who's your sweetheart there then? She's my prisoner. I'm taking her to Stormwind for questioning. Right. Well, boyo, we found your prisoner out here. Armed. With you nowhere in sight. I say your prisoner escaped. Pity the orc would rather die than surrender. Don't touch her. Khadgar then raised his hands, with flames dancing on his fingers. You're flirting with your own death. You're making a mistake, sir. But the sergeant didn't give a shit. He turned to his men and barked his orders. Take the orc. Kill her if she resists. The footman stepped forward, and Khadgar, fighting back tears, unleashed his spell against the sergeant causing him to howl and drop to the ground. Now stop! Kill them! Kill them both! Hold! A veritable army of horsemen then arrived out of nowhere, their leader donning full armour and a visored helm. Sir, please! I'm the apprentice to Magus Medivh. Call off these men. I know who you are. Stand down. Keep the orc guarded, but let her go. I need to see Lord Lothar at once. The cavalry leader then lifted his helm, revealing himself to be Lord Lothar. Well then, lad. What is he? Lothar ushered Khadgar and Garona off to Stormwind for a discussion with King Lane, but said discussion did not go well. In fact, things got kind of heated. Healers attended to Garona's split lip, but could do nothing for her temper. 
and on several occasions, Khadgar winced as she described her opinions of Medivh's sanity, humans in general, and Lane's ability, or lack thereof, to lead an army. She did not beat around the bush. The orcs are relentless. They'll not let up. They'll be back. They didn't even get within bowshot of the walls. No, not this time, but next time they will. And the time after that, they'll get over the walls. I don't think you're taking the orcs sufficiently seriously, sire. I assure you, I take this very seriously. But I'm also aware of the strengths of Stormwind, of its walls, and its army, and its allies, of its heart. Perhaps if you saw them, you too would be less confident in the power of your people. Lane had been just as adamant about the Magus as well. Khadgar had laid everything out for them, sparing none of the juicy deets, the visions, Medivh's erratic behaviour, his complete lack of action in regards to the orcish assault. And yet, if I had a silver grope for every man who's told me that Medivh is mad, I'd be even richer than I already am. He has a plan, young sir. It's as simple as that. More times than I can count, he's gone off on some mad dash or another, and Lothar here would worry his beard to tatters. And yet each time, Medivh was proved to be right. The last time he was here, did he not hunt a demon and bring it back within a few hours? Hardly the action of one demon possessed to decapitate one of his own. But it might be the action of one who was trying to maintain his own innocence. Did anyone see him slay this demon? Maybe he summoned it up. Supposition. No. With respect to both of you, I do not deny that you saw what you saw. Not even these visions of the past. But I think the Magus is crazy like a fox. It's all just part of some larger plan of his. He always speaks of larger plans and greater cycles. And with all due respect to you, your majesty, the Magus may have a larger plan, yes. But the question is, does Stormwind or Azeroth truly have a place within that plan? And so it went on, round and round in circles. But the king remained stubborn in all of his opinions. Lothar, however, had remained mostly silent throughout the entirety of the conversation, right up until he finally spoke. Lane, don't let your security blind you. If we can't count on the Magus as an ally, if we discount the capabilities of the Orcs, we're in trouble. Listen to what they're saying. I am listening. But I hear not only with my head, but with my heart. We spent many years with young Medivh, both before and during his long sleep. We're his friends, Lothar. And with that, the king rose and dismissed everyone. It seemed he was done with that discussion. Khadgar tried to sleep that night, but frustration kept him awake. But the moment exhaustion finally claimed him, and he was about to drop off, there was a knock on the door, followed by Lothar entering the room. Put this on. Meet us at the top of the tower in 15 minutes. Khadgar took the footman's uniform from Lothar and nodded as the king's champion walked off. The young apprentice then struggled into the gear. He did think twice about the sword, but then thought, eh, might come in handy. Once he reached the top of the tower, Khadgar saw Lothar and Garona, who was also dressed up as a soldier. Don't say a word. No, no. You look weirdly good in that. Uh-uh. His Majesty has an abiding faith in the strength of the people of Azeroth and in the strength of Stormwind's walls. It doesn't hurt that he has good people that take care of things when he's wrong. You believe us, don't you? Uh, a long time ago, when I was your age, I was tended to Medivh. He was in his coma. And one night, I thought it was a dream, but I swore there was another opposite me. Watching over the mages. Horns on his head. Beard made of flames. Sargeras. I figured I'd just fallen asleep. It was just a dream. But I never forgot what I saw. And as the years passed, I began to suspect that maybe I'd seen a bit of the truth. We may yet save Medivh, but we might find that darkness is too deeply rooted. We'll be forced to do something horrible, but absolutely necessary. Question is, lad, are you up to it? Kagar thought for a moment and then nodded. Lothar then raised a hand, and Khadgar noted a whole bunch of other mounted griffins across several other rooftops around the city took flight. Looked like they weren't going to be heading back to Karazhan alone, so that was good to know. But without any further words, Khadgar, Garona and Lothar jumped on their griffins, and off they all went. The flight to Karazhan was certainly faster than the walk to Stormwind had been. As the tower grew visible, Khadgar noted that there didn't seem to be any lights on within it. Perhaps Medivh had fled. Guess they'd soon find out. Khadgar thought. They landed on the roof, with Lothar already making his way down the stairs before the rest of the Stormwind soldiers had even arrived, so Garona and Khadgar followed. The observatory was empty, as was the Master Mage's study. The party then descended more stairs, with Khadgar expecting every darkened doorway to hold a deadly ambush. But there was none. The galleries, the banquet halls, 
the guest quarters, all empty. The group then entered the library, and once again, nothing was waiting for them. Although one thing did catch Khadgar's eye. Shreds of paper, fragments of a scroll. What is it? Song of Aegwin, an epic poem about his mother. Lothar grunted a note of understanding, but Khadgar still wondered. I mean, he got it. Medivh resents his mother. But it still seemed like a pretty petty action from a man who supposedly worked in larger plans and greater cycles. Who does that? Who shreds evidence that could be used against them? Hmm. When the group finally reached the lowest level, they found Morose. Or what was left of him anyway. His crumpled form was splayed in the middle of the hallway. His eyes wide open, but his face was surprisingly composed. Garona then made her way into the kitchen, only to return a moment later looking extremely pale and ill. And Kaggar noticed she was holding a set of rose-coloured lenses. Looked like Cook hadn't made it either. The only place left to check was the courtyard outside. But even there, there was no sign of Medivh. Could he have another lair? Another place he would hide? He was gone often. Sometimes for days. But I never knew where. Perhaps he went to the Orcs. To lead them. No. They'd never accept a human leader. Well, he ain't here. Form up. We're heading back. Wait. There was something. Garona then ran back into the tower. Lothar looked at Khadgar, who just kind of shrugged. But the two of them then gave chase and found Garona back in the hallway with Morose's corpse. She was cursing and slapping the wall like a crazy person. It should be here. What should be? A door. There's never been a door there. There's always been a door. Probably. We've just never seen it. Kagar looked at Garona as if to say, what the hell are you talking about? Look, Morose died here, and his body was moved, creating that smear of blood. Kagar then took another look-see at the scene around him, and started to piece together what the hell Garona was talking about. The body had indeed been moved. Perhaps she was onto something. Stand away. Let me try something. So the King's Champion and the Half-Orc stood back whilst Khadgar pulled the energies together for a spell. A spell he'd learned in this very tower, after reading that book about locks and traps and stuff right near the beginning of the story. He tried to envision the door, where the frame would be, where the hinges would be, and where the locks would be. And then he went ahead and flung a bit of magic into it. And to his surprise, the wall shifted and a door appeared, revealing a stairway descending below the tower. And as they moved down the stairs, Khadgar could sense a palpable aura of immediate menace and foreboding. And he soon realised why. This descent was like a dark mirror version of the tower above. Where an empty meeting room would be situated in the tower, there was a dungeon down here. Where a banquet hall stood above the surface was a room strewn with maggots and decomposed organic matter below. The air felt heavy and oppressive and jizzy, just as it had in Huglar and Agarin's quarters at Stormwind. This place was demonic in nature. Eventually, they arrived at some large iron shot doors. This would be the library. He spends most of his time at the top of the tower. So if he's here, he'll be at the very bottom. We should keep moving. But Corona was too late, because Khadgar had already gone ahead and touched the Dark Dimension library doors anyway, and they'd flung open, revealing a kennel. Sargeras had no need for knowledge, so he turned the room over to his pets. And in the darkness beyond the doors, a number of flaming eyes stared at them. Lothar rushed to action, jumping in front of Khadgar and Garona. This is to waste your time and energy, to delay us. Head down and find Medivh. The Stormwind soldiers joined their commander's side whilst Garona grabbed Khadgar and pulled him down the stairs. And as they descended even further, they heard the cries of the dying behind them, from both human and inhuman throats. And Khadgar couldn't help but feel kind of awful about the fact that was technically his fault. The two made their way even further down the dark tower only to find themselves suddenly somewhere else entirely. The scene around them shifted to that of the Stormwind skyline, with the city below them in flames. How did we get to vision of the future? I told him. I told the king, but he wouldn't listen. How do we get out of here? We don't. At least for the moment. Just have to let the vision play its course. Corona then looked around. Well, at least it's just orc armies. That's a good thing, is it? There's no demons. If Medivh was with them, we'd see much worse. Maybe we convinced him to help. I'm not seeing Medivh among our troops either. Some voices rose behind them in an argument, so the pair turned round to see what was what. Bring up the 4th and 5th company to reinforce the breach. Get the militia to organise bucket brigades. The king continued to bark his orders until there was no one left in the room to take any. He then stood there alone for a moment until finally... He looked up, seemingly talking to empty air. You can make your report now. A figure then stepped out from behind the curtains, 
and both Khadgar and Garona gasped in surprise as they realised it was a future Garona. Bad news, sire. The various clans are working together in this assault. None of them will betray the others until after Stormwind has fallen. Expected and countered. We will throw this one back just like the others, and we'll hold until the reinforcements come. As long as men with stout hearts are manning the walls and the throne, Stormwind will hold. The future Garona nodded, and Khadgar noted that she had large tears pooling in the corners of her eyes. The Orc leaders agree with your assessment. She then dipped her hand into her blouse, pulled out a dagger, and shoved it right into the king's heart. I'm sorry. No! The vision ended, returning Khadgar and present Garona back to the dark, nasty halls of the Mirror Tower. I'm gonna kill him. He treated me well, and I'm gonna kill him. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it won't happen. It's true. I saw it, and I knew it was true. Khadgar fell silent for a moment, reliving his own vision of the future. The one with the red sky and old man Khadgar. He saw it and knew it was true as well, just as Garona described. After all this, I thought I'd finally found some place better. And now I know. I'm going to destroy it all. Khadgar took a deep breath and then slapped Garona hard right in the face. You idiot! Do that again and I'll kill you! You can't. See, I had a vision of my own future in the tower once. And if that vision was true, then you can't kill me now. Same thing applies to you. What? So, if I'm to kill the king, then you're going to get out of here alive. We both are. Unless the visions are false. And then you'll die here, knowing you never killed the king of Stormwind. Win-win. Garona processed that logic for a moment until finally... All right. Let's move on. The two continued, ever further down the Dark Tower, until finally, they reached the bottom. Seemed like a giant cave. Hello, young trust. Hello, emissary. I've been expecting you both. It was inspired, I must say. To summon the shadow of my past. A piece that would stop me from pursuing you. Of course, whilst you were out gathering your strength, I was out gathering my own. Kagar looked to Garona and gave her a slight nod. So she moved a few steps to the right. Master, what happened to you? Happened to me? <laughs> We're past that, aren't we? Nothing happened to me. This is who I am. I was tainted from birth. Polluted from before my conception. You've never seen the true Medivh. No. Whatever's happened, I'm sure it can be fixed. Kagar and Garona continued to take very, very slow and subtle steps forward. Garona orbiting to the right, whilst Kadgar orbited to the left. Why should I fix it? All goes to plan, the orcs will slay the humans and I will control them, through warlock chiefs like Gordan. I will lead these misshapen creations to the lost tomb where Sargeras's body is, protected against demon and human but not against orcs, and my form will be free. Then I can shed this lumpish body in weakened spirit and burn, burn this world as it so richly deserves. So you are Sargeras? Yes and no. When Aegwyn killed my body, I hid within her womb. I invested her very cells with my dark essence. And when she finally chose her mate, I was there. Medivh's dark twin, completely subsumed within his form. That's monstrous. <laughs> Little different than what Aegwyn had planned. She placed the power of the Tyrus Falun within the child as well. Small wonder that there was so little room for the young Medivh himself, with the demon and the light both fighting for his very soul. Gagar continued to move left, trying desperately to keep his eyes off Garona, who was creeping up behind the older mage. Is there anything of the real Medivh within you? Some. Enough to deal with you lesser creatures. Enough to fool the kings and wizards as to my intent. Medivh is a mask. I've left enough of him at the surface to display to others. A predatory grin then formed on Medivh's face. Obviously time for one of them villainous monologues that no one asked for. I was crafted first by Magna Aegwin's politics to be her tool and then shaped by demonic hands to be their tool. Even the Order saw me as little more than a weapon to be used against demons. It's hardly surprising that I'm nothing more than the sum of my parts. Corona was now behind the mage, blade drawn. There were no tears in her eyes though, only a steely determination. But as she took that final step, Medivh turned round and punched her right in the face. Kagar immediately raised his hands to cast a spell. Something simple, something quick. But Medivh was quicker. The old mage turned back, and did a full-blown Darth Vader force choke thing on the apprentice. He then raised his other hand, and pain shot through Khadgar. Felt like his joints were on fire, his skin drying out. However, Garona then charged the mages, causing Medivh to turn and focus his attention on the other immediate threat. So as Khadgar toppled to the floor with the wind knocked out of him, Medivh flicked Garona in the head, 
causing her to completely freeze mid-charge. Poor, poor Garona. I thought with your conflicting heritages, you of all people would understand what I'm going through. That you would understand the importance of making your own way. But you're just like the others, aren't you? Corona could only manage a gurgle in response. Let me show you my world, Corona. Let me drive my own divisions and doubts into you. You'll never know who you serve and why. You'll never find your peace. Corona tried to scream, but it died in her throat, and the half-orc collapsed to the floor, sobbing. Her mind completely scrambled, and Medivh simply laughed. Khadgar wasn't faring much better either, really. He just about caught his breath at this point, but his joints still burned, his muscles stiff, and he'd caught his own reflection in the obsidian floor. And his heart sank. He was an old man. The old man from the vision. He'd been robbed of his youth. And he no longer felt quite so confident that he was going to make it out of here alive. One of the negative things about this human form I'm trapped in is that the human bits keep reaching out. Making friends. Helping people. It makes it so difficult to destroy them later on. I almost wept when I killed Morose and Cook. Can you believe that? That's why I had to come down here. But it's like anything, really. Once you get used to it, you can kill friends as easily as anyone else. And now you get to die, young Trust. Seems your trust was misplaced after all. Medivh! Lothar, champion of Stormwind, appeared, heroically. Classic Lothar. And Medivh's face seemed to soften for a moment, although the mystic power he'd been summoning in his hand still burned. Anduin Lothar, old friend. Why are you here? Stop it now, Med. Stop it before it's too late. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to fight you either, old friend. You have no idea what it's like to do the things I've done. Harsh things, but necessary. I don't want to fight you, so lay down your weapon and let this be done. But Eve then opened his palm and bits of magic then droned towards the champion. You want to help me, don't you, old friend? You want to be my servant? Come, help me dispose of this child and we can be friends again. There were stars dancing around Lothar's head for a moment or two, but then they faded, and he took a slow, firm step forward. Then another one, then a third, and then Lothar charged. However, he was charging at Medivh, not at Khadgar. The mages were surprised, but only for a moment. He quickly dodged out of the way of Lothar's first strike, and then continued to dodge and counter every subsequent slash and cut afterwards. Until finally, Medivh tossed Lothar across the room like a ragdoll with a wave of his hand. So easy. But... As Medivh once again turned back to where Khadgar had been kneeling, he saw the apprentice wasn't there anymore, and then realised the apprentice was right behind him, pressing the sword that Lothar had provided back at Stormwind right against the Magus's left breast. So, it comes to this. I don't think you have the skill or the will to use that properly, young trust. Well, I think that the human part of you, Medivh, kept others around despite your plans, as a backup, so we could put you down. So we could break the cycle where you cannot. I never meant to really harm anyone. I only wanted to have my own life. Whether those words were true or not, Medivh's hand raised once more to try and scramble Khadgar's mind, but he never got the chance. Khadgar lunged the sword forward, piercing his mentor's ribs and his heart, and he didn't stop there. He drove the blade straight through the Magus, right to its hilt. Thank you. I fought it for as long as I could. Unfortunately, as the life drained from Medivh's eyes, his form then started to change, with horns sprouting from his brow. Sargeras was finally coming to the surface, but Lothar then picked himself up, as well as his rune blade, and then chopped the demon prick's head off. And then it was over. All that remained of Medivh was his skin and his clothes, emptied of all of its content. It was kind of gross. We should get out of here. But Khadgar shook his head. I need to stay here. Attend to a few things. Greatest danger may be past, lad, but the obvious one's still here. We have to drive back the orcs and close the portal. Khadgar thought back to the last vision of Stormwind burning and Lane's death, and he thought of his first vision, of his now-aged form on that red-skied world taking a final stand. And then he noticed that Garona was no longer present and had buggered off somewhere. I must bury what's left of Medivh, and I should probably find Garona. Lothar grunted, but then shambled towards the exit. However, he did turn to say one final thing, it couldn't have been helped, you know. We tried, but it was all part of a larger scheme. I know. A part of a greater cycle. One that now at last may be broken. Lothar then buggered off, and Khadgar gathered up what was left of the mages and returned to the tower above. He found a shovel and a wooden box, and put the bits of Medivh in said box. He also placed the tattered remains of the Song of Aegwin in there, 
and then he buried it all, deep in the courtyard. After Medivh was buried, Khadgar dug two more graves, one for Morose and one for Cook. And when that was done, he let out a deep sigh and looked up at the tower itself. Karazhan, home of the most mighty mage of Azeroth, the last guardian of the Order of Tirisfowl. But then, something caught his eye. A flicker of movement along one of the balconies. A ghostly figure, just sort of hanging about. And Khadgar nodded and smiled to himself. <laughs>